Um, Councillor Elizabeth Ige, thank you so much for joining the Housing and anti poverty Scrutiny Meeting today. Now, can I ask when everybody speaks for them to turn their microphone on and obviously when they have finished to turn their microphone off. Um, we have a bit, I wouldn't say it's a light agenda, but we do have a presentation um, on damp and mould that we'll be doing today. Um, first, I'll start with apologies. We have apologies from Councillor Greenwell, and we also have apologies from Councillor Debt as well, and we have apologies for lateness for Izzy Cook. Does anybody have any urgent business to declare? I take that as a no. Um, does anybody have any declarations of interest they would like to? I also take that as a no. Okay, so we're now going to go into the repairs update. So this is the repairs transformation program for damp and mold and condensation. We do have a full panel today, which is quite exciting. We do have um, Richard Parkin, we have Bethany Mind, and we have obviously Councillor Pat Sattery that's here, and we have an SME. I did forget your name, if you could just kindly remind me. We have David McGlisson as well, who is an SME from a consultancy firm called Potter Raver. So thank you very much and welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, we also have Dermot Malone, sorry, <laughs> least but never last. <laughs> Um, can I kindly ask, because this is a really packed presentation, that we save our questions to the end of the presentation? Um, and I don't know, Richard, would you like to start, if that's okay? Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Chair. So, as requested for the committee, we're going to give an update on the repairs transformation programme, and then also on uh, the work we've been doing on damp and mould. Uh, you've done the introductions, but the, the main piece is going to be from Dermot Maloney, Head of Responsive Repairs and Voids, and Beth. Uh, who is Beth Mindham, who is our uh, program manager for the Repairs Transformation Program. So they're going to handle the presentation together. And then David, there was a request from the committee to bring an expert on damp and mould. Uh, we brought David along, who is, a, I think you're a chartered surveyor, that's what I'm right in saying that, a chartered surveyor from one of our consultancy, Potter Raper. So um, to give an external viewpoint of these questions that uh, the committee want to ask of somebody external to, to the service around, regarding damp and mould, when we get to that part, um, then by all means, uh, David will be able to answer whatever questions he can. Um, so at that point, I'm going to pass over to uh, Beth and Dermot to take us through the presentation and then obviously uh, carry on from there. Okay, okay, oh, cool. Oh, okay, all right, all good. Um, okay, so yeah, as Richard said, we're going to give an overview around the transformation program and then do a bit of a deeper dive into damp mold and condensation. So we've done some introductions, but we'll start off with a bit of background and context around the transformation program itself, including the approach that we've taken so far. Then I'll hand over to Dermot, who's going to talk through some reflections a year and a half into the program. Then back to me, and I'll talk through some of the key things that we've delivered. And then we'll go into more detail around um, our approach to improving the council's damp mold and condensation offer. And then finally back to Dermot on what's coming up next. Yeah, sure. Sorry, Chair, I forgot to introduce Karen Slines as well, who is in the room. Um, Karen is our actual damp and mould manager, so if people have questions about operational stuff on the ground, what's happening day to day, Karen can join us at that point and, and, and answer some questions. Chair, could I just um, point out that we received the um, slides um, uh, well in advance. I'm sure we have all read them. So just so you know that we've, we've looked through those in detail, so perhaps you know, uh, you might like to just add to, to the slides rather than, you know, repeat what we've seen because we, we, mm. we've, we've, we've looked at that. Thanks. Yeah, we can try and keep it brief and we could potentially pause around halfway. There are quite a lot of slides, um, so we could potentially pause if there's questions coming in um, and then, yeah, potentially not keep presenting if you feel like you've already got everything that you're getting. Okay, cool. So if we start off with a bit of context around the Transformation Programme. So the Transformation Programme is an ambitious four-year change programme, and it's a joint collaboration between the Council's repairs and digital teams. And we're essentially on a mission to radically improve, modernise, and transform the service so that it meets the needs of our residents and our staff. 
So where did the programme originate from? So essentially back in the summer of 2022, the digital team spent a lot of time doing a research phase, essentially spending time with the repair service um, and with residents and with staff to really understand what's going well, what isn't going so well, and what are the opportunities to make things better. So what then fell out of that was a quite lengthy conversation around three and a half hours with our repairs leadership, housing leadership, and digital leadership. And we came to the conclusion that there were lots of problems to solve, lots of things to improve, and the decision was that we need to really invest in this, dig in this together, resource it, and stand up a program. Um, and this needs to be a kind of long-term commitment that we're digging in together over time. So what has the approach been to that? So it is a large program. Um, we've worked in different phases. We've broken that up with multiple teams. So there's around 20 people that work across the program in total. And that's a mixture between digital and also repairs and operational colleagues from customer services as well. In terms of the digital skill set, it's really um, disciplines that are revolved around service transformation, service design, organizational change. And then from the repair side, as you imagine, operational managers, supervisors, etc. Um, but what has been really key has been working in those blended teams. So for example, we talk about damp mold and condensation. That's my team working really closely with Karen, for example, the data area within the program, we're fully kind of joined up with an analyst from our side and an analyst from repairs. So that is really kind of integral to how we're working as a program. So then in terms of our ways of working, so I guess the key message here is that Within repairs, there are many problems to solve, and often those problems, I'm sure, kind of resonates with you in terms of what comes through your inbox. Some of those problems are connected, some of those problems are disconnected. Um, so really, the way in which we've achieved good things in the program so far is through incre incremental delivery, so not trying to solve all of those problems in one go. So what that has looked like is we've often worked in sort of six to eight month phases, and within that, we've had teams formed around defined problems and outcomes. And then the other thing that's really key to this, which we come onto in the slides, is collaboration, so working across silos, working across different teams in that blended way, like I said, but also really involving residents and staff through every step of the process, so any sort of new change or thing that we're making, really doing lots of co-design and lots of research um, with our users. So four work streams, ambitious change. So I've put this slide in here because in terms of the presentation today, I've sort of cherry picked in terms of examples from the program. But really what, what I'm trying to convey is that it is an end to end sort of full transformation. So we've got things ranging from systems and technology in that sort of purple team. We've got things which is all about improving residents' experience. So ultimately what we're really trying to achieve is giving residents more ownership around the end to end journey of their repair and improving that experience. Then we have the yellow team, which is much more internally focused, so around people, processes, and culture. So we need to improve systems and technology and the resident experience, but we also need to look inward as a service. So what is our workforce? What do our job descriptions look like? How are we structured? What does performance and productivity look like? And we work really closely, as you imagine, with Dermot as the head of repairs on that one. And then the final one is data. So this is about getting data into the hands of the service in a way that we haven't before, and then using that data to make more data-driven decisions. And also also improve the accuracy um, of our data as well. So a little bit more around the approach. So involving residents throughout the program. So this has ranged from kind of more of the more formal engagement that you'd expect. So presenting updates at things like the borough wide housing panel events or engaging with the resident improvement performance panel. Um, but then really just going out and about across the borough. So um, a lot of my team spending time in community centers and libraries, um, doing testing with residents, showing them our work in progress as we go through, as well as also research interviews. We do have a resident sort of paid research panel as part of this as well so that's something that we've advertised quite widely um, in things like talk housing we also tap into our neighborhood community champions so yeah trying to reach residents as much as possible um, and so far we've had some really good engagement and involved residents in, in everything we've done in terms of improvements and then similarly with staff as well, so some of the kind of more formal engagements like away days that we have with staff or directorate leadership forums, but really just getting there and spending time with staff in Birchmere. So again, lots of co-design workshops, lots of testing, um, lots of conversations and working in those blended teams together with staff, which has been a really sort of nice thing and something I really enjoy about the work. Final thing in terms of approach, and then I'll hand over to Dermot to talk about some of the reflections. So we've had really good political governance around the programme since we started. So what this looks like in practice is we have bi-monthly, what we call member-level repairs transformation groups. 
What that consists of is I often give a kind of cross-program update and talk through the current focus of the program, and then we do deep dives. So into those four different areas, we kind of pick one, and we show sort of counsellors some of the detail of the work. We involve them in some of the decisions that we're making. Um, and I obviously can only speak from an officer's perspective, but yeah, generally these feel like really kind of collaborative spaces. Um, so yeah, I'll hand over to Dermot to talk a little bit about a year and a half on. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Um, so whilst all of that critically important work is taking place, we're doing that in the context of a live business. So we want to ensure that we can make immediate changes and that the services that residents can experience now, there's also um, an immediate uh, and, and tangible benefit for themselves. So as you can imagine, repairs business is a very complex area. You're dealing uh, with thousands and thousands of repairs per year. Um, you've got many means of contacting the, the council. So this just covers, for members, a couple of key areas that we've that demonstrate the improvement that we've made in our offer to residents, because ultimately uh, that is why uh, we are here. So if you look at summertime last year, Broadly speaking, we're looking at about 18 minutes for people to um, to, to wait before they would in, um, get an answer on our repairs um, hotline. We've now very much reduced that down to an average of most recently full month of five months and five minutes and 23 seconds. So a much better offer there. Equally, in terms of the level of calls being answered, we were doing just over half last summer. We're now um, well over um, 80 percent, so a much improved uh, um, a position there. And equally, again, in terms of the wait time, we have reduced that. Of course, we want to get it as low as possible, and that balance has to be struck about how much you invest in the service in order to get it uh, lower. But just important for members to hear, we know it's important to, to your constituents and residents. We are giving this focus, and we do continually want to improve the, the offer um, for for our residents, and that is that is reflecting in, up until recently now, 80% um, of those calls into that responsive repairs lines are answered. Um, voids is a critical area for the for the council, as uh, as you can imagine. Um, we need to release much needed homes back into the supply as quickly as we possibly can. Um, and so we have um, spent a lot of um, energy and time um, in our voids team to ensure that ultimately uh, we make those properties available. So in terms of the amount of days. On average, if you take all of our voids together um, and say, on average, how long does it take? We were we were over 120 days um, uh, mid last uh, mid 2022. We're now in a situation where that is significantly reduced down to 94 days. It feels a bit long sometimes, but then we remember remember in that you're talking about some of some of the properties very complex. Some of them are for specialist um, residents. Some of them are maybe old heritage type buildings. That just they need a lot of investment in them, and so this is a this is a piece of work that we're going to continue to involve on, and improve that situation. As a backlog overall, as a local authority, we had about 425 voids mid mid 22. In the backlog is in work to be done before they're relet. We significantly reduced that um, to under 200, and we'll continue to progress that. Um, as, as, a, as not only is it um, disappointing because much, it's much needed homes are out of supply, it also has a financial exposure to the council. And at the time, we were running about 1.4 uh, million pounds in rent loss, and that is significantly reduced down to under 400,000 pounds. Um, also, in terms of a critical area, and we'll come on to this uh, uh, further in, is the need to get um, our damp and mould condensation offer into a much better place. It's very important for our residents, and it was it, those um, what we call DMC queries were going in into the context of thousands and thousands of other jobs, and we. Um, determined that it needed its specialism and focus. So since then, we've we've um, we've um, uh, prepared and mobilised a dedicated damp and mould team, such as importance. That includes uh, bringing in um, surveyors with the, the the required skill to deal specifically with um, DMC um, um, queries. Um, Obviously, for us, we want to ensure that the immediate uh, need, as in going to somebody's property 
as early as we can to undertake that mould wash, remove the immediate uh, mould presence. We have invested a lot of um, energy and time getting that to a better position. So again, last year we were probably running around under 60 per month. We're now, d d January, we did uh, just under 300. So a significant um, investment in resource internally and with our contractors to ensure that we, we, we get into residents' homes as quickly as we can to, uh, to remove it. We've also looked to ensure that we're a bit more intelligent and focused about residents who have a degree of vulnerability rather than potentially other, what we say, general needs households or, or households who wouldn't have that necessary vulnerability. And we've very much ensured that we're conscious that they get an enhanced priority offer because of the, so we can uh, respond to that need. Um, in terms then of where we are about the, the journey that we're on, and Je um, uh, um, um, Beth touched upon this earlier on, broadly speaking, when residents experience the service, the, re the, the, the level of satisfaction are relatively high. The challenge is, is frankly, we need, to get, we need to improve the service, get into homes more quickly than, than we are, um, and that ultimately, um, um, ultimately is what works. You, it, we're, we're not complacent enough to hide about 80 percent sounds good for the 20 percent. That's their lived experience, and so that mean that they've, from their perspective, they're not happy. So we need to ensure that we're giving um, that uh, the required uh, focus. And just some of the comments you there touched upon some of the feedback that we received about residents not being able to contact us in the most efficient way that they would wish to do so. Since then, we're trialling different things, um, and it's about understanding is there is there a different or simple approaches we could make, frankly, to make residents' lives easier. So, for example, that first point talks about the plumbing follow online. So if a job requires follow on work, rather than the resident has to go to the back of the queue again and wait for that follow on, at the time in the person's home, we give them the appointment. And that, um, and that just makes it much more efficient. And then residents know where they, know where they stand and it just, um, it, it's a better situation for them. Also looking at improving the, the website, um, the, some of the web pages were, were out of date, so they couldn't find, residents couldn't find the information, simplifying it, making it easier for residents to access, uh, to access and ultimately get the information that they need to do. And that's an evolving piece. Frankly, overall, I think in the coming years, we need to improve our digital uh, proposition for residents. So they don't have to, those who are able to, don't have to wait on the phone, they can do it digitally. But that's to, that is to, to come. Um, in terms of staff, while it's easy for me to talk about change, ultimately I don't do the plumbing jobs, plumbers do, carpenters do it. So it's important that we need, we need to ensure that we know that the, the valuable resource that is our staff within the DLO, they're informed, they're engaged, they know what's going on, and that they, they are involved in the, in the, in the change. Because uh, you can't tell people to change, you have to support them to change and, and bring them on that, um, if you will, that journey um, with you. So as Beth touched upon earlier, part of our approach is to ensure that staff feel that they are involved in that change. So when we int introduce change, we launch it with them, make the change, how's that getting on, make a further iteration, repeat, repeat, and ultimately, um, because, we, uh, because we want to get them on the side. And actually at this point, and, and just to credit to staff, one of our highest um, um, scores in terms of resident satisfaction we get is residents talking about the service that they receive from our trade operatives. So we want to, we, we absolutely uh, recognize the value that they have, um, uh, they, that they play. Uh, okay, so yeah, that's just some high level reflections and some stats and things there in terms of showing the progress that we made. I'll talk through now some of the key things we've delivered and then maybe we could pause just to see if we want to go into questions or we could do the end of the presentation around dump model condensation, depending on how people are feeling. So um, I'll keep some of this short because some of it's kind of building on what Dermot said. But one of the projects within the program which has been really successful has been around reducing what we call lost jobs. So just move this a bit closer to me. Um, what we're talking about here in terms of lost jobs is that stat around residents, around 80% of residents with a repair underway, not knowing when we're coming back. Um, and residents sort of being left in the dark. So these are lost jobs in terms of jobs that kind of lo get lost in our systems and fall through the cracks, but also where we've stopped communicating with residents. So 
then the resident thinks that their job is lost and then they then call us and escalate and escalate because they want to understand, understandably, what is going on with their repair. So this project is all about helping residents know what's happening with their repair and mitigating that need for residents to sort of project manage and escalate. So what have we done? So we carried out some research to understand the different causes of lost jobs throughout the repairs process. And we then prioritized and launched some experiments with the service and then started working with teams within the service to support this. So that looks like regular check-ins. It looks like training materials and processes and us also ensuring that we're capturing data. So if we're standing up a trial, how are we then understanding the impact that we're having and are we actually addressing the causes of the lost jobs? So these are what some of those trials have looked like. So we've got the dedicated follow online, which Dermot just spoke through. So this is something that we started with our plumbing trade. So just starting with one trade to begin with. Um, and as Dermot said, so now if a plumber goes out to a property and a follow one is required with the resident there and then, they will then call that follow online. The tech admin will then book in the job and then that is then resolved for the resident. Another thing that we've been looking at is the information that we send out to residents. So this relates to our text messages. So we know at the moment that our text messages don't um, actually have enough detail in them. We don't often name what the trade is. There's also things around residents sort of helping us to prepare for the repair when we get there. So we've been looking at different text templates to try and help improve of our communication and then also looking at our no access policy so at the moment quite a lot of our repairs jobs result in no access so what we mean by that is the trade worker going not getting access to the property perhaps the resident isn't in or perhaps there are like access needs there as well so we've been looking at that in terms of what often happens then is the trade worker will out card so we've been looking at that overall process so how can we kind of mitigate no access how can we make sure that when we are going to a property we're ringing to the residents lots of times what do we then do when we are at no access and we are at that point how do we then try and communicate with the resident what's the kind of out card that we put through their door so it's that sort of, sort of tweaks that we've made to the process um, working with trade staff on that one so just cherry picking on this one, so starting off with the follow online around the impact that we've had. So this is the most progressed trial, um, but as Dermot said, so uh, so far we've had 1,026 follow onlines uh, handled, sorry, calls handled through that line. So that's around 1,000 residents that now know what's happening next with their repair, which otherwise before would have been in that process, maybe not hearing back from us for a few months, and then calling our contact centre and trying to dig in to find out what's happening. Within that, around 85% of those jobs are then being booked in within the week, and that's something that's been consistent around the sort of four or five months that we've been running this. That remaining 15% um, are jobs that are more complex, so perhaps there's a multi-trade element to this um, or other factors, and so that then is taking a bit longer, but really importantly, that job is not lost. Um, in total, we've estimated this is saving around 130 hours call time, so this is based on an estimation of, okay, around 1,000 residents now know what's happening with their repair, which now means that they're not calling our um, frontline contact centre at the Willis Centre and trying to find out what's going on. A really positive feedback from plumbers as well, so I think initially the plumbers in this trial were a little bit cynical, you know, it's an additional thing that they're going to have to do, more conversations they need to have with residents, ringing a, a, a new line, all of this kind of stuff, um, but actually they're really engaged now and are proposing new ideas and implementing new parts of the process as well, which is really positive. And we have a better understanding of causes of lost jobs. So um, overall, it has been really positive. We're now going to be looking at scaling this out to another trade. So we're going to be starting this up with the carpentry trade. Once we do that, we'll then be hitting 50% of all of our repairs jobs. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see as we scale this with another trade, how that goes. But that is um, evidence really of the really good feedback we've had from residents and the enthusiasm from staff during the trial as well. And then I thought it'd just be interesting to show you a little bit more of the detail around the texts that we've tested with residents. So this is where you can just see some of the things around um, different things we've trialled with. So having texts which are more around like the consequence of something, being more supportive in our tone, um, things around how do residents prefer to have information, do they prefer having a link or would they like that written out in text. So these are different um, templates that we've tested with residents. So another thing that we've done is around managing our call volumes and our queues. So Dermot's already spoken through some of the stats around this, so I'll speak through this quite quickly. But yeah, a lot of efforts really to reduce our call volumes, which is obviously has a really big impact on our residents' customer experience with us. A lot of this has been through additional staffing as well as an additional manager to help manage performance. And we also now have messages on our phones um, letting residents know where they are in the queue. And a really nice example here from Pat with a resident saying that this has actually led to them being able to reduce their their phone bill from having that information and that autonomy to make a decision do I want to stay on the phone or do I not and then yeah the, the stats kind of speak for themselves in terms of um, the reduction in time 
But we know that that's just one part of the problem, and this is where we speak about this kind of complex environment with lots of problems to solve. So it's really important that we reduce call volumes, but actually we know at the moment the overall customer journey is quite convoluted and is quite complex for residents and is quite frustrating. So we've um, started a project which is all about uh, looking at this kind of overall customer journey. Um, what you see here on, on the right is that there are four, currently four different numbers that a resident could call us to contact us about a repair. When we then include the kind of online options that we've got, that means that there's six different channels and six different ways that a resident could contact the council about a repair. So obviously what that results in is um, it's yeah, quite confusing to residents to navigate. They don't necessarily know where to go. And it's also really difficult and challenging operationally as well. So we've done a big research piece essentially looking into this. Um, we've analyzed data on call volumes. We've shadowed staff in each of these different teams um, to really see you know, how are they interacting with systems? How do they interact with each other? What are their conversations like with residents? We've discussed challenges with managers. And then we've also considered and put forward a series of different options options um, and what we're really talking about there is different operating models around how we can improve this so that's going to look like changes to structures to roles and responsibilities but all with the aim of improving the resident experience and being more efficient and um, final one in terms of uh, program deliverables and then we can pause if we want to is around the website and web form redesign work so Really important to say whenever we talk about website and online improvements that we're never going to be getting rid of the ability for a resident to call us um, and pick up the phone to us. But this is really about for those residents that are able to, to go online, to be able to do that in a time that suits them and in a simplified and hopefully um, in like a kind of experience that isn't frustrating for them. So what have we done around this? So as Dermot said, so we did um, a really big revamp essentially on all of our website pages related to repairs on the council website. So we now have 36 pages of updated, accessible and accurate content. Included in this, we have new guidance around what repairs we can and can't help to fix because we found often residents sometimes ringing us, getting a bit frustrated, thinking that we're responsible for something, um, and actually that's not the case. So being really clear about what's our responsibility, what's the resident's, New guidance around damp mold and condensation as well, and this includes photos on our website because we know that it's difficult for a resident to sometimes diagnose, you know, what is damp, what is mold, what is condensation, and then separate guidance for leaseholders as well. So I won't go into masses of detail here, um, but just a couple of examples. So we had quite a lot of jargon on our website before. I think one of the examples that I like is the use of rechargeable repairs. When we spoke to residents, they didn't really understand what that meant. So then we simply changed that to repairs that we charge for. We also have our repairs handbook on the website, and this is uploaded as a PDF. We know that there's accessibility challenges around PDFs. So as much as possible, we've lifted any really important information out of that and lifted that onto the website um, so that if someone does have a visual impairment, for example, they can still access all of the information on the website. The other thing is around web forms. So we went live with a couple of new web forms. Um, we had one web form before, and this wasn't really very utilized from residents. It was really um, lengthy, and also it wasn't really um, easy for a resident to kind of communicate what they want to. So what we found is when a resident is coming to our website or trying to contact us, it's either to report a problem or to request an update, um, mostly you know, reporting a problem or requesting an update on a repair. Our existing web form had sort of the request and update option buried in in quite small text. So we basically split this web form out into two web forms and then the responses of those web forms then go directly to the right team. Um, we also have the ability for a resident to upload a photo of their problem, and that's adding really good detail and helps us to diagnose the problem better. And we also have SLAs around this, so a response time within five working days, and that's something that we have broadly stuck to operationally ever since launching these. So again, won't go into massive detail um, because we don't really need to, but a few changes in here. So you can see things, for example, uh, previously we had, I think, seven or eight questions around COVID, and these are questions that we don't really need to ask. You can also see the way to request an update um, just sort of buried in there with just one line there, and we've sort of separated that out. So all of this is really about helping residents to explain their problem to us um, and us making sure that we're getting the information that we need, it's being sent off to the right team, and that we're diagnosing the problem, we're being detailed in the questions that we're asking, and we're doing that in a way that's kind of non-jargon and makes sense to the resident. So that's it for that section. The final bit is damp mold condensation. So I don't know if you want us to pause here for any questions or just get through to the end. I, I don't mind. I'll pose the question at the panel. Who would like to 
post some questions to them. You will do. Okay, yeah, it looks like there's quite a few questions. Thank you very much for that extensive um, report. It's good to see what journey you guys have been on, um, looking at the customer touch points and how you've identified the gaps and what you've done also to provide solutions. So we really thank you for, for that. I will start with this side. So I'll start with Izzy. Um, I then saw David's hands. Was Magella's hand up as well? Your hand, and I saw Johnson's hand. So it would be Izzy, David, Magella, and Johnson. Hello, hopefully quite a straightforward one. Um, so you said it was like a four-year transformation program. What, how far into that four years are we at the moment? Um, and are we kind of on time, I guess, on target? Um, for that? That's a good, that's a good question. You're now testing my, my maths. Um, so we've been running for like a year and a half. So I think the program takes us up until 2026. Um, it's a difficult question to answer in terms of like, are we on track overall? I think broadly, yes, I think we are. I think some of the things around our technology and systems, that's the real long game. Um, and that's just because it's a very complicated landscape. There's lots of upgrades that we need to go through and system implementations are just really big from like a technical perspective and also training onboarding staff. So I think if we were to fall behind on anything, it would be that. Um, but I would say broadly um, on track around things. Great. And then to follow up on that, I guess. So would the next part be, like, would there ever be a, a point where if somebody wanted to check what stage their repairs are at, they could just log into like an account and it would say, oh, look, you are at this point and it should take two weeks for that. Yeah. So that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the first phase, and I haven't gone into detail on this in the program, but in the first phase, we did a series of technology options appraisal and we looked at uh, a resident online digital tool. So ultimately where we'd like to get to, and this is where we talk about a resident having ownership around the end-to-end -end journey, is a system that they can go on to, they can uh, basically book, track, and schedule their own repair. So that's where we'd like to get to. Um, but yeah, that's going to take quite some time to get there, but that is the goal. Perfect, sounds great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so it's good to see that there's been some improvement in the... Um, in, in sort of the waiting time and contacts. Obviously, what we're principally concerned with, though, is outcomes. Uh, I can see the outcomes in terms of voids, but in the other properties, the vast majority of properties which are not voids, um, I wondered how we are doing in terms of outcomes. So what percentage of jobs are being completed successfully um, compared to before the transformation programme? What time and cost are they taking? How many visits are they taking? What sort of performance measures are we putting down and how are we measuring productivity uh, to ensure, because I know there is a, you know, there, there is a productivity gap, which is all, all related, and how are we measuring that, how are we measuring number of visits, time and cost. Um, I'm also interested, you mentioned 85% satisfaction level. Um, does that measure all, does everyone get a text afterwards or an email afterwards asked to fill in? Does that represent all repairs? the 85%, and how does that compare to pre-transformation? Because it's always actually, satisfaction's always been high um, of the people that have actually had the repair. The problem's been that not everyone's always had the repair. Um, and then finally, um, sorry to go on, I've probably got more actually later on, but the CRM system, which you obviously mentioned, and I've raised this so many times over the years. You know, I have a British Gas home care um, insurance for drains and electricity and water and white goods and the heating system and so forth. And when something goes wrong, uh, when I need them, I just go online and book and I choose the date I want them to come. Then they text me and say, well, we'll be along that day. They confirm and then they'll confirm again on the morning and then they'll say, oh, we'll be you know, half an hour away or whatever and then they'll come. And then afterwards, I'll always get an email saying, well, the problem's been dealt with, and um, you have to sign something, and the problem's been dealt with, and uh, then what did you think of the engineer, and did they complete the job satisfactorily, and so forth. Or it might lead to specialist part or something, and then uh, you know someone else will come with the part and fit it, and what have you. Um, so there's always that follow-through with the British gas uh, policy, and, and that's what I've always said we should have, in terms of our tenants. So A, they're in control, but B, they know exactly what's going on and they can go into their system anytime mm -hmm. 
and interrogate and, and remind themselves when the appointment is and so forth. So I just wondered how, I mean, we've been talking about this for years. We've had lots of digital refreshes as a council, uh, lots of transformation programs, and refreshes in our, our repair system. How far off are we of having that Rolls-Royce standard for our tenants and leaseholders? I think I can answer part of the first one, and then I'll hand over to you, is that okay? Um, and then happy to take some of the, the second and third. So I suppose in terms of uh, like performance and looking at data and all of that operationally more with Dermot, but I suppose the context of transformation within that, and I think the role that we play, is around really improving the quality and the accuracy of that data <clears throat> and then producing kind of critical operational tools that Dermot can use and that his managers can use to then performance manage and basically overall have oversight of their service. So what I'm talking about there is we've built a performance and productivity dashboard um, and a data model that basically pulls in systems, data from all sorts of different systems. And what that has is the ability for a manager to break down into the trade into where we haven't before. So a manager having a plumbing area, for example, being able to click into his trade, then being able to see how many jobs have I got done today, how many are completed, how many are overdue, how many are cancelled, and then also being able to break down into the operative level as well. So clicking on my trade worker, how many jobs have they done, how many jobs have they not done. So we've got these manager pages, which is really kind of getting that data into the hands of managers so they can performance manage. But then also service overview pages, so looking at a year-on-year -year comparison. And that is a, a tool that we've created in that data stream. Um, so I see that as being a key sort of enabler in terms of some of the things you're talking about in your question. But I don't know, Dermot, if you want to come in on anything more on question number one. Of course. So, um, data. It is very, very complicated. Um, so we've, as, as, as Beth has touched upon, we spend quite a lot of um, time and energy trying to understand, can we see everything? Can we count everything? And it's still an evolving journey, but I think we're in a very much, much better place than, than we were. So the data, when you're dealing with broadly, my, as, a, as an example, to give you some context, so not including uh, gas and electric, those compliance pieces, most other trades. We took about 50,000 plus um, orders last year for the full, um, for the full uh, financial uh, year, 1st of April to the end of March. Broadly speaking, we, did, we completed about 45,000 of those. So you're running at around 90%. Within that, however, there's a lot of complexity. We're still dealing with some residual backlog, which we're, st we're putting um, some time, energy um, to, Two, so we're, we're, that is not a job done, and there is too many examples for our liking where residents are waiting significant periods of time for their job to be completed. But I can confidently say that the, that, that time is reducing, reducing, and reducing um, each and every month. So broadly speaking, 90% is your figure, but there's a lot in that. Within, within that um, global figure, trade by trade, it's a very, very different story. So some, some trades like carpentry, they're well over 95%. Some of our external trades, frankly, are closer to 50%. So it's a real mixed bag depending on which trade um, you use. So what we're trying to do is say, okay, well, what is, the, what is the demand coming in? And have we got the resources in place in order to meet that demand? So for example, as a, as a recruitment strategy, rather than simply saying, a carpenter retired, let's hire a carpenter. Let's take a step back and say, well, how many carpenters do we actually need in order to meet that demand? So doing that type of um, data-driven um, approach is really what is the key to trying to grapple, which is a very, what's a very complex um, beast. Time and cost is also something we're looking at. Um, the cost, obviously, the biggest, far and away, the biggest cost we have as a business is our staff. Uh, they are a fantastic resource but we put significant amount of, um, amount of um, financial resources into that. We, we are now at the point where we take the global figure and put it down to trade, and now we're going down to 
productivity information. So you take all your carpenters as an example, and you, and you say, well, how many, how many jobs each carpenter is doing per day, per month? Where do we need to help that carpenter get more, understand if there's any, um, any ways we can help them improve their productivity, um, take, um, take the appropriate action if we feel that there's, there's, no, there's low productivity, the things that you would do within any, any reasonably functioning organisation. And it, we're at the stage now where we're giving, a part, part of this is the data isn't just held at one level, it's about giving that information data to managers at the right at the right places, so they can make those um, those um, uh, those interventions. So there, so it's that those are broadly speaking the 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 main kind of headlines on on our occupied business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. If I go on the on that question, then happy to talk about the satisfaction um, feedback from residents as well. So yes, totally hear what you're saying in terms of that being something that is offered um, in many different places. And it, it sounds like such a simple thing, like, oh, we could just have something like that here. The reality of our technology and the landscape that we have at the moment means that it is a very long and quite painful journey that we need to go on. So in order to get to that point of, so we've made the decision around bringing in a resident digital self-serve tool, which enables exactly that. So the resident goes online, they book the repair, they schedule the date and when that repair happens, we then notify them at different points along the process. So that is something we've looked at, we've evaluated it across the market, um, and it's something that we want to bring in. But before we can implement something like that, we first of all need to really upgrade our technology within housing. So we are significantly behind in terms of just the yeah, the kind of modern level of where our technology is. So in order to implement something like that, we have to go through a series of upgrades, and that is across all of housing across the council, so not just repairs. So that's a really big kind of upgrade piece of work that needs to happen. We then also need to look at the... Um, the systems that our trade operatives are using and improve those because we know there are lots of connectivity problems at the moment and that's really slowing down the pace at which we can do jobs. And then that system needs to integrate with the resident online tool. So we, that's absolutely what we want. It's just we have to be really intentional around the different implementations and upgrades. We have to sequence that in a certain way because of the constraints that we have at the moment in terms of our technology, if that makes sense. So I think it's then about, okay, those are the constraints we're working in, that's going to take some time, but then what are our levers at the moment to improve things? So when we talk about, for example, the customer services review and looking at sort of the text messages that we do send out, how can we improve the content of those? How can we still look at the residents' end-to-end -end journey at the moment without those systems and make sure that we are notifying people in a way that makes sense, giving them the, the best information with our contact centres as well, with that resident sort of journey? How can we also look at streamlining channels and not giving them as many numbers to call? So so that's very much the space where we've got agency to make changes and then that kind of wider system CRM goal is there, it's just going to take some time. Um, I just, I, I'm just slightly concerned about the, the fact that you, you, you you, you were a bit very vague in terms of price, time, efficiency, productivity, and so forth. And if we don't know the as-is situation, then and we obviously presumably know what the to-be situation is, where we want to be, then how are we going to measure how fast we're getting there? So I'm, I'm very worried. If any transformation program is all the sort of, you know, where you are, where you want to be, and how you're going to get there, if we don't know where we are, then, then it, it's going to be very difficult to sort of measure the level of progress. Yeah, I'm, I might be sort of misunderstanding it slightly, but I suppose the where we are piece really happened in that summer 2022 before we stood up the programme. And if we go back to the like, reflection slides, a lot of those stats are from summer 2022, where you can see where we were in terms of call volumes, where we were in terms of voids. So that is that sort of was our as-is, and that then informed the different priorities that we did. And then it's also about 
you know, looking at things like our resident satisfaction, like you say, looking at our complaints. So, for example, we've set up the follow-on line within plumbing. What does that then mean in a couple of months' time? Are we getting less complaints from residents around communication? Are we, for example, with damp mould and condensation, looking at stuff from the housing ombudsman? So are we getting less interventions from that? So I think a lot of that, as, as is, is there. And then I think a lot of the things that we've done in terms of transformation so far, we are a bit constrained by context. So that means that we are sort of creating interim solutions. And it's then a bit early to really measure like the overall impact of that. But we have a sense of how we would measure it. Um, and that is sort of embedded in, in what we're focusing in on at the moment. Um, so I just add a bit of context to that. So as Dem, I think, was trying to articulate, we do know the as is. So we do have data that can tell us now, day in, day out, what X carpenter has done, how many jobs they've done, how productive they've been. And, and a year ago, two years ago, we didn't have that data. We know, as Dem was articulating, that um, certain trades you may only be getting through 70% of jobs. Is that due to productivity or is that just due to the fact that you haven't got enough staff in that trade? So. The data we have now compared to uh, the data we had a year or even two years ago is massively different. We talk in business terms in the sense of we know this trade does this much work and costs us this much and therefore what do we need to do to make that trade more profitable as you would if you were, you were a private business? What do we need to do to make a surplus on that? Which we weren't able to speak about two years ago. That data has been developing over two years. It's still, would I... You know, let, let, let's take that to its natural conclusion. Would I say to a plumber or a carpenter right now, we've got our data that says you've only been doing two jobs a day, therefore we're going to have to terminate you because you're not doing enough work? No, I don't think we're quite saying absolutely we think that data's perfect yet. Do we use it as a good guide to see the productivity of our workforce? Yes. Are supervisors now talking to trade staff about... Do you realise we've got, you've only done two jobs a day yesterday? Yeah, they absolutely are. And they haven't been doing that for, for years. And now we have visibility on that day to be able to say, are you productive? Are you doing enough work? We expect one more job a day off you. Uh, and, and we're seeing, I think we've done that in, in plumbing and carpentry, and we're really starting to see our productivity levels in those services increase because we can talk in a language that they've never heard before. And we've now got the data to be able to talk in that language and, and professional leadership that's never really spoken in that language before about the repair service of, actually, we do know what you're doing now. We can see it. You, we couldn't before, but we can see what you're doing and we can track uh, what you're doing where we couldn't before. So it, it's, it's a massive improvement. And just quickly on, on, on what Beth was saying, absolutely this side of the table, that side of the table, there's nothing but a thirst that we want to get to a stage for customer experience, for savings in the business, for just improving the service that somebody can go online, book a repair, book a date they want, track it, cancel it, change it. We've had a, we, we call it um, a V6 version 6, but we are upgrading at the moment to our NEC system. We're doing about a jump from, I think it's a jump of about five or six upgrades from where we were to where we are. And that's taken around two or three years to get to. The, the, the upgrade should be hopefully happening in the next few months. And that upgrade to the most recent version or the version before actually unlocks scheduling, online planning, uh, the new um, PDAs that will be given to operatives so they stop losing pro uh, connectivity when they're around the borough. Massive leap forward that we've all been waiting for as well. And we are, it feels like we are two months, three months away from that being implemented, which unlocks the whole world of all this good stuff that you're saying, uh, Councillor Gardner, that we're able to then deliver for residents. We want it so badly. We want it as much as residents want it to be able to do that. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm not sure who might answer this, these questions, so you can um, decide who, who best to answer them. Um, first of all, a bit of feedback. Um, there was a rash of emails um, that I received, and I've heard of other councillors receiving them too in February, March, which relate to matters sometimes a year old. It appeared that somehow or other in your system these lost jobs perhaps were being found, I don't know, or that councillors had simply not received responses. I'm, I was mystified by that. Uh, and I was also mystified by the fact that I kept getting apologies uh, from the, um, uh, the teams 
apologising for, you know, not letting me know that a job had been done. And then the, in one case, the leaseholder told me it hadn't been done. So I wrote back and then they said, oh, I'm very, I do apologise. Um, it was scheduled for that week, but then it apparently seems to have not been done. So we're rescheduling it. And I, that's happened with one case three times in the last uh, seven or eight weeks. Now, there's some sort of, um, th th there is a problem in that respect. Some, somehow or other, something's not le linking up. And that's just a bit of feedback because um, you've presented some you know, fantastic uh, um, improvements here. But we as councillors often see the other side. We get um, contacted by people who don't still know how to navigate the websites, who, have, uh, who are elderly and hold on the phone and then uh, are not answered. Uh, I notice your stat stats are between uh, 16 and 20 per cent of phone calls not answered. Now, that's a huge improvement from what it was, but that seems quite shocking that it, we're still at that level. I understand the resourcing and everything that you're doing, but that is a lot of calls not being answered. A lot. Um, and I was wondering whether you could help us as councillors help you by doing a couple of simple things. These are all about communications and communi easy of, easy, ease of communications. You've explained about the websites and how you're, 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 you're making them simplified. What we need as councillors, and I would suggest what you need as well, as if, you know, for what, whichever, in whichever area you're working, is a simple link. For example, um, I'm dealing with a leaseholder, but the damp and the floods are coming from a council property and it's um, affecting the leaseholder. So you said that in your website you have a specific um, link or a specific button for leaseholders. A lot of leaseholders contact us and they don't know that. So one of the things you could do, apart from, you know, making that clear on, the, on the, the website, is to give us a link, send to it all to, to all councillors and say, <clears throat> if you have leaseholders who have problems um, uh, working out how to um, contact the council, which is their, you know, their, the, the responsible body, this is a direct link. So that will be a, um, a, a web link that you'll give us which will go straight to that page. So that person does not have to navigate several buttons or pages or choices before they get to that page. I know it sounds terribly basic, but we are on the end, we're on the end of the complaints. So it could help you if we can make that simple. And if also, if you could do that for tenants. So, you know, if you have, um, uh, a specific one uh, for, for example, um, damp and mould. If you could give us a link so that our, our residents could then go one click and they're there. Because you know that in our, um, in our housing stock, there are many elderly people. There are many people whose language is, first language is not English. There are many people who don't know how to navigate websites. They've tried on the phone, they're trying on the website, but they're not very good at it. A lot of people aren't. And um, so if, if there was a series of specific links that you could give us as counsellors for, for various individual problems, like leaseholders, like damp and mould for tenants, like flooding, you know, so that it could go then direct to a page where they wouldn't have to start navigating. Do you, now, you know, it, I could be talking through my hat here, but, but I know that that's the sort of thing that tenants would appreciate. And um, uh, the, the other thing is, alluding to what I, made, I said before about feedback, I'm concerned 
that I am, for example, in my experience, and I'm sure others have had the same experience, getting emails to say a job has been done. And then the tenant or the leaseholder uh, um, then contacts and says, Where, what's happened? And I said, well, I've been given the information that the flooding has been seen to on this date. And they then come back and say, no, it hasn't. No one was here. So then I go back and go back. So what's happening there? Jobs are being registered as done? Or is your system, uh, m you know, somehow or other failing in terms of, of what's being registered as done and when? Okay. Um, so on the first one, just to clarify, I think, so what, do you, what you mean by that is where we do have, for example, guidance around leaseholders and responsibilities and what we can help and what we can't help with and sort of information basically around that, you would like us to link that to you so that you can then directly signpost that to residents. Is that what you mean? No, what I meant was, if I understood correctly from reading your, your report um, in the lead up to this meeting, you have got a specific um, uh, um, uh, button for leaseholders, right? Because you've got tenants and you've got leaseholders, right? A lot of leaseholders do not know that and they don't understand where they have to go. And so it would be good if, if I got one of those complaints, or if any of us did, and, um, for example, one I'm dealing with right at the moment, and say, well, look, this is the exact link. Have you tried this link? Do you know about this link? You see what I mean? So if you gave us a direct link, so that would be not just, you know, it would just be to, you know, that page, the exact, that, that specific page, then at least I could send that to our residents. Yeah, happy to, happy to like take that away as a bit of a thing and, and send you direct links. I also think maybe there's like a wider maybe comms piece here as well around how we communicate these improvements to councillors more broadly. Um, and when we are making these improvements, making sure that you know about them and that you're signposted to them as well so that you can then help us as well in terms of communicating out to residents. So yeah, happy to take that away as an action. Um, could we take that as a recommendation? Is that so okay with you, Magella? Yeah, take it as a recommendation. Um, do you want to come in on the... Yeah. yeah. Obviously, on, the, on the, the other point about us closing down jobs when they're not actually... The devil was going to be in the detail of that, so it would be helpful to, to, um, to explore, is it an automated message people are getting, or is it an officer writing to you personally to say it's being done? We would need to explore that. Clearly, we shouldn't be advising the resident that the job is done if it is not done. There may be a situation where we've completed a job and then there's been maybe a subsequent follow-on leak or a subsequent issue. So with all of these things, I think it is worth us having, um, having the details. To be clear, we're not aware of a system error at this point that's automatically notifying people that jobs are clo being closed in some sort of rogue fashion. Um, but it is important that we understand the detail. So if you did want to send me some examples um, that would illuminate what the point and the case, we will, we will look at those cases to see is it, is, it, is it for that resident or is indeed there is a system issue that we, we are currently not aware of. But we would absolutely happy look at the detail. Johnson, thank you. Thanks very much. I think, well, that... Um, the query you're just talking about now, um, I will be in a position to actually give you some more information, uh, particularly because I'm coming from a, a resident's perspective and a leaseholder's perspective. And unfortunately, as nicely as the presentation is and all of the plans are, in reality, this is not what is happening. I can give you several examples, but I will keep it very simple. Um, last month, on the 12th, I raised a request online using your web uh, form, uploaded the photos and everything. I got an automated um, reply saying that um, someone will get to me within five days. I got a reply within five days saying, well, that um, they're going to look into this and that somebody will get in touch with me. They will need to assess my situation. 
uh, as a leaseholder, assess my situation and get back to me within another five days. And no, the five days I'm talking about, there are five working days. So invariably, we're talking about 10 working days before they can even look at the repair. Unfortunately, as we speak, I've not received any communication back. So very clearly, you know, something is actually wrong with the system. And I've raised this several times, numerous times, saying, well, that what you have on the system is not what is happening. You, raised, you mentioned something in your presentation, and you said, well, that um, sometimes the, you, you, they go to the uh, uh, officer goes to the, to the household, and they don't find anybody there. They're not able to complete the repair. And this is actually down to communication. Again, I'll give you an example of what happened to me. Okay? I raised a request for a, a, a repair, and um, I did not receive a single communication. Fortunately, at one of our meetings here, I met with uh, uh, the housing director, Jamie, and um, Jamie said to me, okay, don't worry, I'll look into this. Somebody looked into it, and uh, probably it was because I got Jamie into it that uh, somebody actually looked into it. Again, I did not receive any communication whatsoever, and somebody just suddenly turned up in my, uh, my property on a particular day and said, it's for this repair. The only reason I was able to actually attend to the person was because I was home. What will happen on the day that I wasn't actually at home is simply meant well that and they, they will record that as actually coming to the property to come fix the repair. However, no communication whatsoever was actually uh, passed on to the resident. These are some of the things that are actually happening. They're not just happening. These are very recent information I'm actually giving to you. The, the website, it's very easy you know, very easy to actually um, link the website and have a tab for residents and a tab for leaseholders. Very easy to do on the same page. A lot of people. No, it's not. Well, well, as I said um, last month, it wasn't there because I've not raised any re any repair. I know as at um, today, but as said last month, it wasn't there. No. So it wasn't there as at last month. So when I raised the, 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 the repair, it, it wasn't actually attended to. And you can imagine, you know, up to this almost a month um, after I raised the original request, nobody has actually communicated with me. So these are some of the things why, you, uh, you, again, you will say, well, that uh, the uh, productivity is quite low because on paper, things look good. A few days ago, one of your officers turned up my, at my door and said, well, that um, there is a repair that is got to carry out in my, at my property. And I said, what? I said, what's the repair about? And I said, I never requested any uh, repair like that. I said, what number do you have? The officer didn't have a number to the property he was going to. He said he was going to a particular uh, a block, and unfortunately, that block name there's another a similar block name at a different location to ours. So again, you can see the internal system is actually collapsing because the left hand is not telling the right hand what they're doing. So the officer uh, approached my door without actually having enough information on what they were doing. These are some of the things, and unfortunately, what happens is it actually makes the cost of repair uh, uh, astronomical because they have to turn up several times. So if you have somebody turning up for a repair and they don't, um, the repair is not done and it's actually flagged again, they've got to turn up again to the, uh, the property or to a different property to actually get the repair done, they will charge for both visits. And all of these are actually happening. And is that Richard you're going to take? Thank you. By all means, and, and, and Beth might um, uh, add something afterwards. So. Um, I, I absolutely appreciate everything you've just said. Um, and there's nobody over here saying that on paper repairs looks like it's running an excellent service or a good service. On this side of the table, we're saying repairs is running a better service than it was a year ago. And we've got many, many ways of showing that. 
but we're also saying we've got a hell of a long way to go. Uh, and we know that, and we're clear about that, and Beth's articulated a four-year transformation program, of which we're a year and a half to two years in. Things like the, the lost jobs pilot that we've rolling out across the service to make sure that, uh, and people may recall, I, I spoke about this when we did the diagnostic of, you know, it felt like tenants were telling us they were project managing their own repair, they were having to call us, chase us, uh, they were the ones always chasing us. Those pilots are showing that we're improving, getting back to people, booking jobs, they've got that communication, they know what's happening. But it is no way we are saying that it's job done. Absolute no way we're saying it's job done. And John, so we can't speak about the specifics right here, right now, say yes, on that repair, this happened, that happened, but by all means give us a feedback and we can look into and feedback what's happened. But we're not here for a minute saying repairs, transformation, job done, tick, it's perfect. There's not a single person here who will say our repair service is perfect whatsoever. We are articulating a journey we're going on, where we've seen improvements such as call handling and, and absolutely right, we need to do better and we need to do more. Um, and um, the, the voids turnaround we've done, the lost jobs pilot, the stuff we're going to talk about on damp and mould, all have seen an improvement in the service, but all of us here have an absolute thirst that we improve more and more and more. And phase three of the transformation programme is a lot around um, what we're, in, in a sense, I'm calling it back to basics, Beth might, Beth might be calling it something else, but the things that the industry's made us move on, like damp and mould, uh, the industry's moved quickly, the ombudsman moved quickly, there's new guidance out, new laws out that we've had to move quickly. But now we want to really get back to, okay, all those challenges. Was our, job, our, our system's saying that our job's closed but nobody turned up. Why is that happening? What process do we put in place to tackle that? Our system, people are telling us that um, you know, somebody's just knocking on their door and saying, I've come to do you repair and they knew nothing about it. Why is that happening? What can we do about it? How can we talk to residents about how we can change things? So. The improvements are going to continue on. We are not sat here saying we've got an excellent or good service. We're saying we do, you know, we do 45,000 repairs a year. This is considerable, but we know we still have a long journey to go on to make this better. Um, so I, I, I want to give assurances that give that feedback. We're looking into things. We are trying to improve things, but we can articulate we were better than a year ago, and I'm probably going to sit here in a year and say, and we're better than a year ago, but we still have a journey to go on. Yeah, just to <clears throat> just to add into that a little bit. So obviously, yeah, a lot of examples in there. Thank you for sharing um, and can't go into the detail of all of those. But I suppose some of the themes in terms of what you're saying and some of the frustrations like we are really aware of. So we do know that there are a lot of communication gaps. We do know that things can be quite inconsistent for residents. We know that there are problems around how we communicate with residents before appointments. So some of the things I was saying about text messages, we know that sometimes we send out text messages really well in advance and a resident knows. We know sometimes we send out text messages and it's actually really confusing. We also know about no access. It's a really big problem. I think it's around 15% of our repairs jobs. And as, as you're saying, it is really costly as well for us operationally. So I suppose what I can say is we are aware of all these problems and we are where possible. We're trying to set up trials and pilots. We're trying to train staff. We're trying to streamline processes. We're trying to make our systems talk to each other because a lot of that is also what happens and doesn't help. Um, so yeah, we are, we are kind of aware of that. There are things that we're doing, but yeah, recognize that there are absolutely times when we're not getting it right. And that's kind of why we're here as this program and you know, joining up together between digital and repairs um, because a lot of these problems are systemic and we need sort of systemic solutions. Um, so yeah, that's that from me. Thank you very much. Um, Lade, would you like to proceed? Thank you very much for the presentation, quite well detailed. And um, just like Joseph said, it looks fantastic on paper, it really does. Um, for me, um, being um, sitting here sometimes last year, I know that one of the major complaints we had was around how we were responding to repairs and looking at what you have reported here as the progress. And I use the word what you have reported here. Listening to Joseph now, um, it just more like um, exposes the question I wanted to ask, which was around the fact that Oftentimes when we get these reports, it looks good on paper, is the practicality of it. Um, I love the fact that what you have here on page 21 is delivering with, not for. So you're delivering, improving service with the resident and not just for them. And for me, one of the things that I would like to see is the actual details of the feedback that you've received from this resident because figures can be conjured up, and that's the truth. I work in a service where sometimes um, we put surveys out, of course I can prove that, people put surveys out, 
and you know that the result of those surveys can be tweaked, it would be great to be able to see the actuality of some of these engagements that you've had with the, um, with the residents. It's really important because, um, yeah, you could come here and give us all those numbers, but um, they might not be real. I'm, I'm not doubting you, sorry. I'm not saying you're not, but it's about how do you get those figures? What are the data tools that you use? Are they knock on the doors? Are they paper? Are they emails? How do you get the data? That'd be very helpful because that would feed into this. The second thing, I'll, the second question I'd like to ask is, well, not to, this, my second point is actually a question, and that's around how we're responding to um, how we're responding to the mold condensation and um, damp. Um, from what I've heard so far, it looks like we're extremely, re extremely reactive. And I know that David said something earlier about um, this is our as is, what is the to be. Are there plans of using predictive um, technology in being able to look at which area? Okay, so for example, Charlton, we have a lot more mold in that area. Are there issues around um, the environment? Are there issues around the demography of those who live there? Are there things we can do around communication to help to raise awareness so that we prevent. So um, it's, it's more like walking ahead of time because it's actually cheaper to prevent um, than to, to repair. So if there are things that can be done, so if you see that there are more, uh, mold, area, uh, more mold issues in Blackheath, for example, there are concerted efforts put around that area. So it's about being, you know, just thinking ahead, predictive analysis, Technology, this technology is there, but are there plans to use those technology to be predictive in the way we re respond? Uh, thank you, Councillor. So um, we're going to have a presentation on the damp and mould piece. So we might want to do that bit first and then come back to your question if that's okay. Uh, but we are looking at uh, when um, two years ago, when um, kind of the, the coroner's report came out about the average case, we did a report on our system to see where our worst blocks were for reporting, uh, and then we um, paid for some individual service of those blocks. So we deal with them a block by block basis rather than just a responsive service. But it might come up during this presentation. If not, I'll kind of try and answer more on that. Uh, data wise, so when we talk about our satisfaction figures, there's, there's two things I'd say. One, this is done by an independent survey. So it's done over the phone, independent surveys um, by a company called Acuity. Um, and um, they call X amount of people, and I think we get about a 25% response rate. It's not small numbers. Uh, and we ask them, the, the, the question we report on is um, kind of how satisfied were you overall? And it's a five point scale, if I remember rightly. And we only report if people say good or very good. We don't report if they say neutral, bad or very bad. It is that 85% is people saying good or very good. And we have got the data, and I think we used to, I'd have to double check now if we do with Acuity, we also ask um, quality data. So why did you say it was very good? And people give us feedback on that as well. So we could provide, and without a doubt, we could provide reams and reams and reams of, yeah. So telephone, at the moment it's telephone calls. No, but, well, the, we moved away from door source. So if you have a trade operative who stood over someone saying, can you fill this form in to see how satisfied you are? No, we you felt that was... They don't have to be the one asking. So like you said, you have things online. So once the person has um, reported a repair online, it's about that going anonymously to them. The tradesman should not be the one sending, asking them, can you give feedback? Uh, my, my, my view is that we need to expand how we get the feedback and not just telephone because telephone you don't know who uh, you, um it's 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 a lot more difficult with telephone it's so um, i think it's on. great if we can expand the various ways in which you collect feedback surveys from our from our residents yeah and and uh, as far as i know we don't do online at the moment i have to double check that is generally being phone surveyed but we do get vast numbers hundreds of of, of feedback a month so it's not it's not based on 10 people we've called and give these figures it's based on quite considerable but the other thing i said uh, i was going to say is that um we we have two measures of satisfaction for repairs one is when a job is done we call the person and say are you happy the other satisfaction is a general satisfaction survey to to our populace of, of tenants to say in 
uh, general, what do you think of the repair service? And the reason we do that is because if we only call people when the job's done, there's about 20 people, you know, out of 100 people, 20 of them might still be waiting for the job to be done, so we'd never get around to survey them. The general, side, the general perception survey is, in general, how do you think we are with our repair service? And that, across the industry, across industry, always scores less than the actual um, transactional surveys. So I think, as Dermot articulated, when a tradesperson turns up and does a job, people are generally really happy with them. Uh, and really happy with the service they've received. Uh, as Dermot said, we've just got to make sure that happens more often rather than the backlog of jobs we have where uh, if we're only completing, say, for the sake of argument, 90% of, of, of carpentry jobs, that's still 10% we've not got round to. So they're dissatisfied people who are waiting for us to. So we look at both of those figures to see, to see where we are. But I'll take the point on board. I'll check if we do online surveys, but that, once again, absolutely agree. We shouldn't be crossing kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, there's a word I'm looking for, but I've totally, totally, totally lost it. But if, if somebody, in future, if somebody logs a, a repair online, we should be surveying them online. Mm -hmm. Channel, that's the word I'm looking for, crossing channel. If they do it over the phone, we should be calling them back to do the survey. Yeah. So we absolutely should be expending that in future. Yeah. Can I just come in a little bit on that one as well? Um, so just, you talk about some of the, the programme improvements and how we engage with residents there. Um, it, it really does depend on what's the, the problem we're trying to solve, like what are we trying to explore with the resident. But we are, where possible, trying to be like representative, going across the borough. So for example, um, to give you a bit of like what that looks like in practice, so when we wanted to speak to residents to understand just generally around what is your overall experience of repairs back in 2022, the way that we did that is we put a message on our contact centre phones um, that went out to all residents that called us and basically said, we're doing some research into our repairs service. Can you speak to us about it? And as part of that, we detail um, what trade and what job they had, what part of the borough they were from. Um, so we spoke to around 20 residents, but we made sure that we had a real diverse range in terms of what was their experience of repairs, You know, speaking to someone that had a carpentry job and a plumbing job and someone that lived in this part of the borough or that part of the borough and also demographics as well. So when we're going broad, we will kind of go out wide and you know um, try and have a, a representative sample. But then for example, with things like the website improvements or going live with the web forms, that research looks really different. So often what that looks like is us creating some prototypes types going down to a community center and multiple spaces across the borough and basically speaking to residents really randomly have you got five minutes bit of pop-up research can you click through this prototype can we observe how you interact with the system so um, I hope that just brings to light a little bit in terms of the different ways and, and we are really intentional around how we engage with residents and how we do research and how we get their feedback um, but happy to produce a few more examples to show you that if you want to see a bit more of the detail um, if that helps. I would just like to add on a follow-on note to what Lade said. So she's speaking about customer outcomes. Now, a lot of our customers are not SMEs. Do you do any quality assurance where some of these jobs are assessed by maybe like a surveyor just to make sure they are done properly? And she also spoke about preventive uh, measures, you know, being forward thinking. It's a really good point just to make sure that we eradicate these issues. Um, as a former housing association tenant myself, some of the jobs I had that were completed, it was a reoccurring issue. So you're looking at, I was in that property for 11 years. I had an issue with a boiler and it took about 11 years in order for it to be fixed, you know, for completion. So, you know, my question for you is, is there any quality assurance that's actually um, taken place? Um, so yes, there is. So, there, so we issue works through our DLO and our contractors and there is a quality regime. Uh, around that, frankly, it needs. We need to um, very much increase our our, our our position on this. One of the challenges that we've had, and links back to our systems, is though the the key supervisory class of officers, the managers of the trade staff, because of processes in the IT system, they spend too much time behind their desk. So part of the change, and we, it's one of the points we touched in the last couple of pa pages, is looking at how we're structured to ensure that we have the right span of control so a manager has the means, time, to go out and do quality checks to a greater extent than we, than we currently do. For example, doing spe uh, um, speculative checks, so um, non-prearranged, ringing the resident. So we do, we, do, we do do it, 
but to be frankly with you, Councillor, we need to do much more of it. And the critical piece for us as managers is creating the right management structure of competence and also of, of scale to ensure that supervisors have a greater um, ability to do so. And regarding the damp and mould piece, so um, members may recall it was quite a while ago, so around a year and a half ago, two, two years ago-ish, that might be a bit less, when, when um, the Awa uh, Ishwak case was um, in the news a lot, we actually did a presentation to members and said, you know, this is what we know, this is what we know, these are the worst blocks, these are our top cases, so we actually did a report of where, we, who reported the most damp and mould in last year, which individual properties, and then went back and checked. Okay, that property is reported 20 times. They actually reported 20 times, two, so we did it over five years. Two years ago, the intervention we took a year ago, they've not reported since, so we can see that it's actually had an impact. Um, so we did a lot of data analysis on learning what we knew about our damp and mould, uh, and we will continue to do that, and we're, we're going to present on damp and mould hopefully in a second. Uh, but the, the, our focus over the last um, probably six months to a year has been bringing this new damp and mould team in, uh, making sure that when people call us, we can respond quickly, especially if they're vulnerable, uh, and we're going to see some of that soon. The idea is, once we've got that team, when we move into quieter seasons, such as summer, hopefully we get, you know, it's quieter on damp and mould, that's when we move into a proactive uh, situation. That's when we move into, okay, what have we learned over winter? Where do we need to focus? And how do we tie that into the £450 million capital programme we've got investing in our stock? So we can make sure we're being preventative for the next kind of damp and mould season, autumn, winter, spring, for the following year. So the idea is, you know, when you're in the, in, in the deep of it, in winter, when you're getting calls coming out your ears on damp and mould, respond, 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 quieter months. What have you learned? What do we need to do to, to make it better for next year? So uh, we are building that into the process, but the focus for the last six months to a year, and we'll talk about, is, is the team that we brought in and how we can respond when people call us and say, you know, my kids got asthma, I've got damp and mould, we're vulnerable, how quickly can you get around and do something? And, and I think you'll see more of that soon. Um, Maisie, do you still have a question? Sorry, so it's one suggestion and two quite small questions. But the one sort of suggestion is just about um, with, um, so I put quite a lot of residents who are obviously like o older women who live by themselves, sort of um, t tenants, um, only have a landline and use post. And when they get, um, a so several of them having work done alone, and when they get a contractor coming to the door, they, often there's a, there's a letter which might not have the RBG symbol on, it has the contractor's symbol on. So then they phone me up and say, is this a genuine letter or, you know, or, or not? And if it does have the RBG, and how do they know it's real? Um, so I think one thing is maybe if, if, if any post that goes out could also have RBG kind of logos on and could and would say, you know, this contractor has been employed by the council. And if you want to check, you can call this number or quote some reference. And the other is thing is, I don't know whether some of the contractors, outside contractors actually have any kind of, ID, like, are given any kind of temporary ID. I'm not sure if they're given like any temporary RBG ID because I think quite a few of them are sort of a bit hesitant to let people in the houses or, you know, they think they're going to be scammed or they think there might be other things going on. So that's just like a, a one suggestion about how we maybe um, help those residents. Um, and then there's two other sort of smaller questions. Um, one is sort of how we maybe, um, how is it repairs transformation is going to work with sort of reporting more structural problems. So obviously it works quite well if you're uh, taking a picture of like a broken door or a broken window. If someone's taking a picture of like a bowed wall or something and they don't know what's caused it and no, you know, it's all bit, and it's how, how do you sort of see the transformation program like fixing more of those problems where like the resident doesn't, you, do you know what I mean? Would you send a surveyor first or would you start, I'm just interested in the process you have with that. And third kind of question is um, obviously rep uh, repairs are being reported by residents, they're also being reported by councillors. And I know from, I think, all of our casework, that a huge portion of the sort of backlogged casework is from the repairs service. So really, is, is your the transformation programme going to also look at how we report, and if there's anything better we can do as councillors that makes it all easier? Or just also like what that, because it feels like it's like two ways it's feeding in. It's feeding in from residents, but it's also feeding, feeding from councillors. And often the councillors, often end up with quite complex things that have just been dragged on for years or not been resolved. So it'd be interesting to know if your transformation programme is also going to look at like that interface as well. 
Cool. Thank, thank you. Um, so on the, on the first question, happy to come in on that. I don't know, Dermot, if you want to say anything as well. But I think for me, what that really comes down to is um, how we triage and also the questions that we ask in terms of diagnosing the problem. So, um, for example, some of those more structural things, if we think about damp mold and condensation, like we ask really detailed questions around what is the size of the problem? You know, is it covering, is it widespread? Is it um, just half of your wall, for example? Like what color is it? Um, and being really detailed around sort of how we're diagnosing and understanding, is it a repair thing? Is it a structural thing? So for me, it sits under um, that sort of diagnosis area. So in terms of the web forms, we're really specific around and quite detailed in terms of the different uh, drop downs that a resident can answer. And then again on the phone as well. So I think that's where we, address that kind of diagnosis of is it a structural thing or is it a smaller thing? Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. And giving residents the opportunity to upload pictures. Mm. So when they're reporting it, they can say, here you go, this is what we mean. And it, if you, having a picture would obviously just make the diagnosis process uh, um, much, much easier. Then obviously we need to look at, well, when we get into the SIP and understanding, it's, it's ensuring that we have the right technical resource in place. Um, to manage, we are we have twenty thousand properties, uh, tenanted properties, another four to five thousand leaseholder properties. It's ensuring that we have the right technical capacity in the business to do so. And one of the future changes we're bringing in is to bring in, ideally, through restructure, bring in additional technical capacity. So hopefully, there's more resource to handle these cases. Because if you're if we're drawing from the same limited resource, then of course people wait, unfortunately, longer and longer. So that's what I would add to that one. <laughs> Yeah, and then on the um, yeah reporting coming through by councillors, and I guess just overall that communication that happens between members and resident, um, it's not something we've looked at specifically so far in terms of the programme. But for me, that does kind of sit under this kind of wider resident customer journey. Like, what are all the different channels and the different means in which a resident is contacting us? I think it is a valid point that part of that will be members. So I think that is something that we could probably incorporate and look into either in this phase or in a, in a phase coming up into the future. Uh, sorry, Chair. So, um, and it picks up on a, a question asked earlier about uh, complaints as well, and, and members are seeing a significant number of complaints coming back at the moment. Uh, complaints is a really key issue for um, the industry at the moment. The ombudsman uh, is, is, is hot on the topic of how quickly we're responding. Uh, clearly, they're um, giving out lots of compensation if we're not responding on time. And also, we've got the regulator of social housing with new um, regulation coming in for how, how quickly we should be getting back to residents and how we're communicating. So at the moment, we've, we've put more resource into complaints. Uh, and as far as I know, over the last few years, it's always been the case we get more members' inquiries than we actually get complaints from residents uh, on, on, on repairs. Um, so we have, and, and the reason members have seen this increase uh, recently is we've, we've put more resource into it. We know we've got to get better with it. We know we've got to be quicker. We know we've got to answer better. Uh, so at the moment, I think I've got six complaints officers just in the service, in the repair service, trying to kind of get through backlog of complaints and, and get back to members. So that's why at the moment members are seeing this. Uh, we're working through a backlog, uh, in a sense. And, and, and absolutely, we, we, there is that. And, and I see myself, so members might email me, but they've emailed member services, but we've also got a customer complaint coming in uh, at the same time, and how we look at that kind of intersectionality between all those things to solve it. And we're nowhere near, we're, we're not, I'm saying nowhere near it, but we're not, we're not quite looking at that yet, but we're very aware of this a problem. And then somebody, a customer might receive a response from uh, Councillor Slattery, because she's emailed about it, a response from yourself, and then a complaints response from our complaints team, because it's coming, it's coming from various different places. So, uh, as Beth said, these things generally have a good system problem we can probably put in place at some point, and it's something we have to consider. Uh, but we are actively trying to reduce our complaints workload and our members' inquiries at workload at the moment, and we, we're pouring resource into it for, for various reasons. Can I, I think that's a, that's a good here. Can I just make a, sort of a bit of a suggestion about, because um, you talked about all the, quest the questions you ask when you're reporting online. It might be quite good if there's like some kind of template of questions you give to councillors. So when, if we have someone who calls us up and says, um, I've been like, I don't know, I'm waiting for this like leak to be, to be fixed. And, I've been, and, and then we, because well, normally when someone asks me that, I'm like, okay, what is your address? What's your full name? Contact details. What's the, what's the issue? I ask them those sort of things. And then I sort of give it to the members of services and say, I think this leak needs to be fixed. But if there's like more specific questions that we could ask at the front end that like just makes it easier down the train. So like if it's like 
even if it's just a template, it says like if you have a resident who's asking about, I don't know, leaks, damp mold, broken things, and you'd be like, can you also ask them A, B, C, D, and then just have that information going in straight? I don't know. Well, I don't know what it would be, but I feel like just sort of things like that, because it's, it's like otherwise we're only giving you like half the information. Because if we can give you as much information as possible from that, from our end, I think that might be quite helpful. I think Beth, I, I just jump in on that, Beth, and it, and it ties back to the point around the photo as well. The key thing for diagnostic, uh, and, and we'll have a think about what we can do, we can do on, on the suggestion, uh, councillor, but the key thing about diagnostic is really getting the right person there. So one of the things we heard through well, two years ago is, is, I told you I've got a leak, you sent a plumber, you sent a roofer, but it's my bath's leaking, not my roof's leaking, and vice versa. And the example of the, the wall, in that scenario, we probably get very few of those complaints. So if we send, you know, we, we maybe send a structural engineer or we send a building surveyor or a property service officer to check it. Really, the bulk of our repairs are things like plumbing. And you want to just have a picture of, is it the bath or is it that? Is it because a plumber is going to turn, if, if you get the right person, generally 90% of the time they've got the right equipment on their van to fix what's needed to be fixed. So that diagnostic really is just about, can we get the right person in the right place at the right time? And then 90% of the time, 95% of the time, they can fix it. But if, if you say you've got a leak and we send a plumber around and it's a roof job, we've, we've failed. So really, it, it's cre really quite as simple as, can we get the right trade on site at the right time? And then you're pretty much gonna, gonna get it done. Um, so there might be more diagnostic questions we can ask, but uh, I think that we heard a lot of frustration from, from residents about we just sending the wrong trade out. Um, and the pictures really help with making sure we're, we're sending the right trade out. Izzy, would you like to proceed? Yes, yeah, sorry, hopefully be quick. Um, yeah, this back uh, to the kind of next phase um, questions. Really, um, I guess considering what you said about how far behind our tech is, do you feel that we have the right developers or enough developers? I was looking at your program team and I wasn't trying to figure out who the tech developers are in this um, structure um, to be able to get to that next phase. And I guess are you going to be buying in a product or are you looking to build something yourself? Um, yeah, because it, it sounds like quite a, a big project, um, having done some tech stuff before, um, and it doesn't sound like you have necessarily the right resources yet. Yeah, so um, how that would show up in terms of the multidisciplinary team is um, housing IT. So we have a whole housing IT function, which is where all of our you know, technology developers, all that kind of stuff sits. So um, yeah, it is within that. It's just maybe not spelled out in that, in that way. Um, in terms of the implementations, none of it is self-build. Um, so all of them are... Um, I can, I can only think of the acronym, which is SAS, um, off, off the shelf. Sure, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's a lot of that. Um, but, yeah, so it's all in that housing IT resource space, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, this will be the last question. Thank you, Johnson. Sorry, um, mine is actually a recommendation now, you know, and um, if you're trying to actually move people, um, residents and um, leaseholders, more into the web base on the website, I think one thing that will actually uh, uh, encourage them to want to use it is the turnaround time. If you say to someone, you know, you, someone fills, fills a form and they get an automated reply saying that we'll get back to you within five working days, they will never come back again to that form. So again, the attraction is going to be to reduce the turnaround time for the web based um, repairs request. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pausing on that one because it's, it's an interesting one because I think five working days with research we've done with residents and also just across speaking to other local authorities across the sector, that is kind of the standard um, and that is kind of seen as, as a, good, a good response time. So um, I don't know if, it's, if it would be realistic or honest to say to you, like, yes, we'd be able to commit to something that's much lower than that. I think that is generally what we tend to follow. Um, but I do hear your point around the turnaround time and that being a motive. And I also hear your point around, okay, well, if we do have five working days, thinking about other, some of your other examples, we need to actually be consistent with that um, and make sure that we are, if that is the, the target that we can achieve and we can't sort of push much more than that, um, making sure that we are consistent around it. But yeah, the sort of five working days is generally um, when we think about contact centres and responding to residents and just also across the sector, um, that is generally the, the standard. Thank you very much. I think we can go on to the next section, <laughs> which is to look <laughs> more into damp mould and condensation. Thank you. 
Okay, cool, right, so final bit of the slides. So yeah, this is a bit around the more in-depth, more detail around damp mold and condensation. So um, as we've alluded to a couple of times, we had a project within the programme which has been focused in around this and looking at our offer um, across the service. So the way in which we've approached this, so similar to other projects, so researching into the current challenges, so spending time with residents, shadowing staff, actually going out across the borough, um, seeing some of these jobs happen in practice with trade workers. We also spent a lot of time speaking to the sector on this one, so we've spoken about it a couple of times here, but there's a lot of work happening in this space. Housing Ombudsman is getting more power, there's the social regulator for housing, there's a lot of regulation that's happening around this, so lots of housing associations, local authorities, etc., are all really thinking about how they can improve things, so speaking to other organisations around this. We then worked with um, DMC specialists and operational colleagues to then propose and prioritise recommendations and then designed this up into a future service offer and then began to implement that. And then a key thing within that has been inter mobilising an interim team, which we'll come on to. So <clears throat> when we talk about this ideal service offer, this is what the team designed based on the research that they did with residents, with staff across the sector. I won't go into masses of detail in this. I recognize it is a little bit of an operational diagram, um, but essentially what you can see here is different activities and different things happening depending on whether we're preventing, we're triaging, treating, or we're monitoring the cases of damp mold and condensation. So if we start with that blue column, we've got things around prevention. So this is where some of the things we've spoken about before. So our summer block surveys. So how are we being proactive around those problems areas within the borough, things around joining up with our capital works. So we know that um, there are problems with damp mold and condensation, but we also know that some of those problems are actually to do with the structure of our buildings. So we need to be joining up with those wider programs of work around that and ensuring that as we do build more properties, we are mitigating um, the chance of long-term cases of damp mold and condensation. And we also then have um, information, leaflets, things on our website for residents. If we then go into the triage section, Essentially what you can see here is a resident is going to go through a different route and is going to get a slightly different response time depending on their vulnerability, depending on the severity of the case, and also depending on whether it's um, complex or reoccurring. So different triaging happening there um, in terms of our contact centres and also our new team. Then we've got the treatment stage, so um, I'm sure we're all conscious of this, but damp mold and condensation cases often being um, a bit complicated, so we might need to have an inspection. We might actually think that something is a damp problem, but we might realize that actually it's a leak problem, so then we have to raise a plumbing job. Sometimes we then have to do follow-on works, um, so that's what you're seeing there in terms of treatments, various different things that would happen. Then we will, with, in terms of monitoring, with all cases of um, damp mold and condensation and all jobs, we are having a three-month follow-up call. If in that conversation we then find out that the problem hasn't been resolved and it's reoccurring, the resident will then go straight back into the triage and they'll go directly through to our new damp mold condensation team. If the problem was resolved the first time, then that case will be closed after a year. So that's sort of what we designed, that's what we're aiming for, but going back to what we are saying before about incremental delivery, not being able to solve all of the problems at once. So these are the, the key areas for change that we are then identified in relation to that service offer. And then this is what we've been focused in on over the last few months. So standing up a damp and mold team, trialing that two-stage diagnosis and triage, shifting to be more proactive and less reactive, deciding whether to offer a mold wash kit, and then setting and measuring targets. So I'll try and talk through these um, fairly quickly. So one is around standing up this team. So this is something that we used to have as a council um, we got stood down a few years ago, but yeah, through sort of recognising the demand that we've got coming through, all of the complexity within damp mold and condensation, came to the realisation that we absolutely do need a team around this, and we do need specialist expertise. So that is what this interim team has looked like, um, and this was stood up um, ahead of those kind of really busy winter months, and we've definitely reaped the benefits of that in terms of getting through our backlog um, and having that resource there. So that's the interim team. So the kind of last paragraph here is the important message. This team is going to be a Adapted. So that's not the permanent structure, that's what we stood up interim. The permanent structure will be based off of what we've learned from the capabilities of this team, how the data looks over time, how we've performed, etc. 
This is the two-stage triage. Um, so again, I won't speak through all of this, but essentially what we've got here is um, where you see that kind of new DMC team coming through. So now in terms of damp mold and condensation cases, or sorry, not now, but once this is implemented, what that will mean is all damp mold and condensation cases will go through a second stage triage. So those cases at that point of the resident contacting is being reviewed by the specialist team. If it is an urgent case, it's going straight through to the specialist team straight away. Um, so again, it's just these, depending on the severity, depending on vulnerabilities, things like that, um, will then mean that that is going through to a fast response or going through to the team and it's being treated in a more robust way. As part of that new triage, <clears throat> we have a new web form pathway. So we've spoken about the web forms before, but essentially if a resident goes online and they're reporting a problem around damp mold and condensation, we have designed a new pathway that they will go down. So they will then go down a different route and we will ask them really detailed questions, sort of what I was speaking about earlier. So really getting into the detail of what's the size of the problem, what color is the mold, um, where is it within your, within your space? Is it easy to reach? Is it not easy to reach? So lots of questions that we're asking here really to help us identify what's going on. Any, if a resident fills this in and it's an urgent case, this uh, response from the web form then goes directly to the DMC specialist team uh, as well. Something else we explored um, was the concept of a DIY self-mold wash kit. Um, so what this would have looked like, it would have been an add-on to our repairs service. So we wouldn't have been removing anything else, um, but really you know, giving residents the opportunity to have a free self-mold wash kit so that they could um, wash away the mold themselves if they wanted to, and perhaps that might mitigate the hazard early on, and that might get to them quicker than what we do, for example. So these are some of the things we were considering. We did quite a lot of research around this. We spoke to our team, we spoke to legal, we spoke to the sector, we spoke to residents, to members. As you can imagine, it was a bit of a divisive topic. Um, in the end, I think particularly some of the concerns we had from the sector, different organisations that had done this before, and also concerns around sort of legal cases, so residents potentially hurting themselves with the mould wash kit. We decided that the benefits didn't weigh, outweigh the risks on this one or the cost, but it was a really interesting thing to explore and think about. Um, sort of moving now to being more proactive and less reactive, so joining up more widely with those kind of larger programs of work. So we've got the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund. This is really about energy efficiencies and um, implementing a series of energy efficiencies, I think in around 665 um, properties across the borough. What we've then done is we've joined up with them to make sure that within that, those energy efficiencies are also contributing to a reduction in damp mould and condensation. And then another thing that we've done is we've really increased our collaboration with the Capital Works team. So we now do have that DMC team um, and we have that resource, but we know that there's only so much within their remit of you know, what is uh, a reasonable thing for them to be doing in terms of a job. And sometimes it is more wider structural work, so wider ventilation or insulation work that needs to happen. So when we are identifying those cases, we're then passing that over to our Capital Works teams for them to then um, do that work. And then the final thing around damp mold and condensation is around setting and measuring targets. So it's all well and good us standing up our new team, but what do we want that team to be working towards? What are the targets that we want to set? How are we going to measure ourselves um, and see how we're doing? So these are some things that we've achieved so far. So that web form submission and getting back within residents within the five working days. With the mold washes, we've really increased... Um, how quickly we're we getting through this. So throughout the winter, within three working days of first contact for a high priority group, we've been getting those mold washes done and also within 11 working days of first contact for all others. And then also that damp um, inspection. So within five working days of the assessment call. So that's really good in terms of what we've been achieving on that. But then where would we like to get to? So where we'd like to get to is be more aspirational, to have agreed timeframes, agreed SLAs, which is something that we would publish, um, you know, setting those expectations with residents, also enabling residents to hold us to account. So a couple of additional things that we've added in here. So one is around that assessment call that relates to the kind of triage process that we're implementing and also um, something around completed work. So uh, overall, what are we kind of setting ourselves in terms of getting that job done, job done end to end? So that is it on damp mold and condensation. We have two more slides around what's coming up next, which I was going to hand over to Dermot for. So we do those couple of slides and then that's it and we can open up for any more questions. Go for it, Dermot. 
Thank you. Okay, so part of it is, I think we, we've touched upon it, we recognise the point, listen, this is, this is a point in time, we've much more, um, we're on, on that journey and it is about um, moving it, moving this uh, programme on. So begin, as I said in the beginning, it creates some real tangible benefits for residents. So part of the transformation programme, this is very much a collaborative piece between operational teams and our digital um, and customer service team. Part of it is just continuing that, make the, make the changes, research, make informed um, changes to how we model, see what we can implement, see what we can s scale, how much it's going to cost, what resource do we need, and critically, as, as members have identified earlier, being able to measure what is the difference um, in terms of what we've made after that change has been uh, has been made. So some of those key things that runs alongside this, this is outside, some of them are linked to the transformation program, some of them not, but also very critical is uh, speaking about um, our Birchmere offices, which is primarily where our repair service is based. It needs investment. It needs upgrading um, in order to give our staff much needed quality of office accom accommodation. If we accept, expect high standards from our staff, we need to ensure that they, we give them the commensurate tools, including a modern fit for purpose um, place for work. So we, we, we know we need to do that. We spoke at length about systems upgrades and invitations. I won't go into that again. And we spoke about the contact channels, that we spoken again. Um, the other thing about looking at how we train our staff and documenting those processes, we need to do a lot of, we, we do need to uh, invest in that. Um, we are, we're currently in a situation where we need to, frankly, resource it. Um, because if we don't train people with defined processes, then we're, allow, we're um, asking our staff to basically do what they think is best. That's fine in some cases, but we should be working for defined processes that ultimately get the best outcome for residents as quickly as we can. A critical one then is obviously restructuring the team. We've just commenced um, recently um, a, a fairly significant proposal about restructuring um, some of our critical lines of business. Um, we want to make sure that we are, as we introduce change, we're supporting staff as best we can. But obviously, making sure we keep the shop front open. We, we, we're not introducing change in a vacuum. This is a service that takes thousands and thousands of jobs each month into, into the business. Um, so we want to make sure we do it in a measured way um, that as we introduce uh, those changes to teams, roles, responsibilities, that we are um, cognizant of uh, ensuring we're still delivering services. And then finally, again, we spoke about it uh, earlier on, it is about using data to drive, um, uh, uh, drive performance and make informed decisions about where we need to do. There's lots of things we want to do, so sometimes we're going to have to prioritise um, uh, wh wh where is our energy, what can we afford to do, uh, what's feasible to do, um, and throughout all of that is using um, uh, robust data to, as you, as you would in any sensible business, uh, using data to inform and drive the decisions that are, are deemed priority. And that's, that's it. Thank you very much for that. I will start with questions. Um, I'll start with Lade and then I'll start with David. I think I kind of um, went ahead when I asked the question earlier about predictive analysis. But there's a second question I have, and um, this is about how can we um, um, use technology um, in improving how we can work with residents. This is specifically around possibly ventilation systems or humidity control, how that can be integrated to mitigate damp, mold, and condensation effectively. We, we might want to chime in, Karen, at this point around, we, we're doing some pilots with different technology, aren't we? We're doing, sorry, we're doing different pilots around technology. I haven't yeah, mentioned I, it, but... I, can speak to it. I, think you're, 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 I think your question is probably a broader broader one, which we might need, um, need to go, come back on. But one of the things we are doing as part of the Damp and Mould offer is using sensors. Um, so we've, we've uh, via the council's company, um, uh, Digital uh, Cities, 
Thank you. Um, we are piloting a project. We've just started. We're, we're in about 140 properties now. And in essence, what it involves doing is putting environmental sensors inside somebody's property that you can identify when humidity increases, um, how the property is being used. So is the, um, is the, if the bathroom is particularly after somebody's using a shower, it just there's a spike. Um, are people keeping the temperature? And it's all very, very clever stuff. But in essence, what the sensor is doing is taking lots of people, uh, lots of pieces of data, and then remotely you're able to in theory, and we're still at the, at, the, at the beginnings of that project, you're able to, rather than just make an intervention, leave it alone for a while, wait for the resident to call you or, or, or schedule a visit, it, um, in, in a very live time way, be able to get some solid data from the property. So we're, we've, we've, as I said, we're, we're in about 140 properties now. Now it's at the stage of um, analyzing what those results would be. The next evolution of that would be potentially having an app on somebody's phone. So when, they, when the environmental condition spikes, so steam goes super up and there's no ventilation in the property, they get a little trigger to say, in a very friendly way, open your window or turn up the heat. So we're, we are, that's, that's something that we are, um, that we've, as, as an example of using technology that we're currently trialing. Okay, so I'm just going to go a little bit further. Um, what you've just described is quite reactive um, what I am describing is something thinking ahead. It's having something to a building strategy, or sorry, housing strategy, where um, the ventilation is controlled. So you're not having to ask the resident to open the windows. Something to do, I'm not a scientist, but I do know that this can be built in, because I've read it. They can be built in where automatically um, a system goes on in the building where because the humidity is high, it would auto just like something you have in the bathrooms. Sensor, sensor um, extractor fans. Thank you. So it's about thinking deeper, so we're not just being reactive, we're not waiting for the mold, for the condensation to build up. The building immediately takes it up, or the structure of the building immediately takes it up. This is something that we need to think ahead. Um, it, it's not something that we have now, but just something for us to think ahead. I think, I think it's right, and I think it, uh, technologies change all the time. My, uh, my initial thing would be, it would depend on the building. So some of the newer stock that the council is acquiring and putting in, into its um, HRA portfolio, its housing revenue uh, portfolio, it's more likely to have that ability. The challenge we would need to understand, and uh, I'm speaking outside of my area in terms of asset management, but you're talking about retrofitting, potentially some buildings that are Victorian, some are... Uh, are in the 1920s, the 1960s and 70s flats. So I think some building cell, some buildings will lend itself potentially where that, so that solution works more easily than others. And of course, then the other the question is at, at what cost? And um, retrofitting is inherently much more expensive than designing it in from source. Um, but I know there are new buildings coming into to stock. So it would be, I think, it would be a, a challenge about um, does it work technically? and how would you fund it? But absolutely, technology increasingly, I'm sure there's experts here at the table can speak more eloquently than I. Technology, obviously, is, is if prevention, as you, as you say, is, is less expensive, um, in addition to being a better solution for the resident than, than trying to go back in repair. Um, sorry, I'm gonna play devil's advocate here. Um, as I say, as a former tenant, I did have an issue with damp and mold in my bathroom, and that was because I didn't have a, a window that was allocated for that bathroom. That was the actual layer or structure, may I say. Now, I had to fight tooth and nail for a surveyor to come, and I made a suggestion for an extractor to be um, embedded into that bathroom area. So what essentially happens is well, before you go and have a shower, you turn on the light, and obviously that structure is working, and that eradicated the mold. And I would also say another problem was there was a lot of mold that would gather in the ceiling, so sometimes it's using a particular paint that actually is, um, it repels mold as well. So some of the issues that we do have are quite quick fixes. The technology is good. It's a good way to do going forward, but with some of the older properties, there are some quick solutions that we can do. So I definitely do think as a recommendation, we do need to have a solution surveyor that comes out and assess these properties just to kind of implement some of these recommendations going forward.
I think I would uh, I would agree with that. It is as as we as we um, stand up our damp and mould um, dedicated team. One of the things that we are judging ourselves in is exactly that point, Galster. How long does it take to get a surveyor to the property? So that's absolutely critical. It is something at the moment we've we've been achieving around five days. That can go up. That can go down depending on peak. Obviously, it's more challenging in the winter, but it. But just to assure you, it is something as a specific performance measure we're looking at um, at how quickly we can get the damp the, the damp surveyor visit done. And in addition to the paint, we have we are using um, in some fashions we are using those that, that damp um, repellent uh, paint. Um, so that is something that we are doing. The question is how we use it as as, as a more uh, extensive rollout, but it is something that we use as part of as part of our uh, part of our offer. In addition to things like using, um, some residents will have difficulty with bleach products, so we have non-bleach products. So we are looking at a range of of um, if you will low tech solutions as well as not just relying on remote data. Thank you for that, Pat. Uh, Chair, I just thought as we have got David here, who is a chartered surveyor, damp and mould consultant person, and we invited him apparently specifically, I didn't realise, um, and bearing in mind we've not got much money, I would just thought David might be able to say a few things, especially around retrofit maybe, David, because that's where we are with the majority of our properties. Thank you. Hello. Sorry. Um, not necessarily about retrofit, but I was going to suggest about the paint product. So I think you're talking about a standard emulsion paint, which might attract mould. Whereas if you use an eggshell product, for example, it's got the wipe clean finish that you can then quickly wipe off any mould that, that presents itself, which will commonly happen in a bathroom. Do you know any more about monitors that are available? Yes, yeah, so the, the extract fans that were suggested, you can get some with relative humidity meters in them and they'll automatically engage when they reach that point and it becomes humid within a bathroom environment. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, David, would you like to proceed? Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's not the first time when Chris Colleton was the AD, we had a, um, a task force to deal with damp and mould. I remember umpteen reports to Cabinet at that point <laughs> to deal with a backlog. And, and there was a real programme of how many cases we were going to deal with over so many weeks and so forth. Um, it was regulation, then obviously eventually it, it worked through. But I wondered, with all that work that was done, and the, uh, you know, the work that we've done in cladding on places like Barnfield, Valleyside and Charlton, on Well Hall Road and so forth, of, of many blocks, Ernest Dance and things, that hasn't that actually made a difference in terms of our resilience um, and preventing damp and mould, the amount of investment we put in uh, to properties, um, and the work that we've done before on, on, on averting damp and mould. Secondly, I was going to ask, this came to mind when I was in um, Charlton last night at, uh, where was it, um, Fletching Close. There was a big issue there about uh, guttering just not being cleaned and not being cleared, and overflow pipes where there'd been some leaks down the overflow pipes, you could see it was so damp down the wall that clearly it was going to go through at some stage. Um, I just wondered, are we doing that on a, are we clearing guttering on a systematic basis every year or every two years? And how does that work? Because obviously if guttering gets crowded out, then you're going to get leaks down and so forth, which will eventually penetrate depending on how thick the wall is and the materials and so forth that are being used. So I just wanted you to ask that point, how systematic we are at, on, those, on those issues. I um, can't unfortunately, I'm not in a position to speak to the, the first question, I don't, I don't have the history I'm afraid. Um, I think on the guttering clearance one, it is something that came up, one of my areas is the roofing team. And when I joined a year or, or a year and a little bit ago, one of the things that was identified was exactly that, that we are getting um, um, leaks and the like because we haven't cleared the program. Uh, we haven't cleared, cleared the gutters. So we have started it. Um, so we've identified, I can't speak, to, I don't know the exact name of blocks, uh, unfortunately, but we have start, started, um, I would say, a micro um, program 
where we go out and we clear gutters, um, guttering, it is something obviously that to get true benefit needs to be scalable. It was informed, we did take, try again, try to take a data uh, analytic view and look at the, the greatest frequencies of, of complaints and then go back and see. If, so we've, we've identified a short, um, a short list and also obviously managers and experienced officers at the time go to that block that always has issues with that one. So we did we did create a mini um, a, a mini block book. But don't. It, but as I said, it's I, it's, I think it's probably um, it could do with the potential to grow that uh, for the, for all the benefits that you that you cite. Is it systematic? Is it proactive or reactive? Systematic. That was the point. It was, but the systematic for those blocks so that you go out on a planned basis and clear the gutters rather than waiting for waiting for the coal but as i said it was it's micro in scale to, to be very clear about but it is it proves the point that we shouldn't wait we should go out in advance like um particularly blocks where have you can't um we're a green burrow so you can't cut trees down but you've got lots of leaves going into burrows uh, into into guttering that's one of, that's some of the examples that um we're aware of Jack, just to, um, the, 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 the first question, um, we're in a very different world than we were a few years ago when it comes to damp and mould, uh, and a very different um, ombudsman, uh, and a very different situation with residents' understanding of damp and mould. So it's very difficult to compare, have we had less inquiries, because we've probably not. We've probably had more recently, given what's been in the media and given what's been in the news, and it's led to more inquiries. So does that mean we've got more damp and mould than five years ago? I'd say probably not. Does it mean more people reporting it? Yes, it does. And an example is a very small example. So on, on Barnfield, um, once again, this was a presentation read about a year and a half ago now. And that did have the insulation. And actually, we looked uh, before the insulation the, the, uh, and after, we'd, we'd had 50% um, less reports of damp and mould in that block. It, it, is it definitely because of the insulation? We can't say, but it, it seemed to be that insulating that block led to, led to less damp and mould. So we do, we do have some of that data and look at that data, but it's a very different situation than we were in five years ago. Uh, more... Um, housing ombudsman inquiries, more things in the media, so people chasing us, more disrepair cases where there's, uh, and, and it's the anecdote of, you know, um, lawyers in Liverpool, big firms chasing disrepair cases and raising more and more and more. So I don't think we're comparing like for like, so it's difficult to compare like for like numbers uh, on things. Um, and uh, th there was a team before, and I think Karen was in the team before of damp and mould, uh, but over COVID, because they couldn't go into properties, I think that team was disbanded because it was a lot of agency staff that we were just spending money on, but they couldn't go into properties, so we, uh, that, that team was disbanded, and it was right that we brought that team back in now to, to tackle these things. Thank you very much. Maisie? Thank you. Um, uh, what's one bit of, is how... Um, how drying clothes in flats um, contributes to sort of damp mould condensation. Um, I know I can speak from my own house, but I'd be interested in what, to hear your sort of like professional opinion about, about that. But also there feels like there's a bit of um, a link or, or some work to be done between sort of as well, like potentially like closing drying rooms. So I've got like an estate on my, in my ward where the drying rooms are being shut because of fire safety concerns. At the same time, um, residents' awareness about damp mould condensation is increasing. And at the same time, obviously, energy bills are going up, so people don't even really want to be turning on radiators to, like, dry clothes quicker. So you've got, I've got, in that entire, you've got more and more people drying their dry clothes in their flats because of the, and so I don't know if there's, I just understand why we'd be, why you'd maybe close the drying rooms, but if it's like there might be a bit of work to be done or a bit of like some links to be made between, I don't know, if it's like there's a few things, like, combining there. But that's the, but I just yeah, I, I, I could jump in there. Um, I think you need to look at it as where the industry as a whole is at the moment. It has a, 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 an old regulator with new regulations. It's got new things like the building safety regulator. It's got the housing ombudsman, which has got a raft of new powers. And all of those things in an industry in a very short space of time are making massive changes. So we're having to react to fire safety stuff, which is closing drying rooms. We're having to react to damp and mould with the ombudsman stuff and the, and the regulator stuff. And we're having to react to... Um, you know, less funds across across councils and stuff. It's a very, very changing environment at the moment, and, and we are um, 
and we do sometimes trip over ourselves because there's so many conflicting priorities at the moment. And I guess I'd say it's incumbent on me and my job is to make sure that Dermot's team is speaking to Sue Murray's team, who's the head of uh, housing compliance, and Edward Haribo, who is the strategic head of asset management and investing in our stock. But that's where we're really trying to have some of those conversations about um, SHDF, Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund, which is all about wrapping a property up and making it warmer, but also then that could lead to more damp and mould because you're, you're trapping the humidity inside, so we need to make sure we're putting ventilation in there at the same time and, and, and not having two different priorities conflicting and, and unintended consequences. So we are doing that as much as we can, but it's a really, uh, uh, there's been so much change in this industry over the last year and will continue over the next few years as we all try and kind of tangled with all these different priorities that um, that is that, 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 are, that are sometimes conflicting and and you know overriding all of our priorities are things like fire safety and are things like um, resident safety and that's always the top of my agenda and, and we present to various boards on that um, so yeah you're you're entirely correct and it's kind of incumbent on me to try and make those links uh, where we go forward Thank you very much. Does anybody have... Okay, Pat. <laughs> Johnson, you have one. Okay. <laughs> Sir, well, I think while mine, again, is a, is a recommendation, you know, because um, I know you did mention that um, training is something, well, that um, you really want to embed into this transformation plan. And I think it's super important, you know, because I can give you an incident that um, one of my residents actually reported to me. You know, they came to actually repair uh, a dam, and um, they, there were two um, officers that actually went to the property. When they got there, one of them said, well, that the water is still dripping in, you know, that uh, you can't actually just eliminate the problem by just painting over it. And then the other one said to it and said, well, that's, that's what we've been asked to, to come and do, fix this, um, this problem, fix the dam, and then they painted over a wet wall. You know, at the end of the day, you know, again, going back to what I said um, previously, we're not effectively actually um, spending the money that's actually been allocated to, uh, the, to the unit. So training is super important. The other thing again that I notice well that um, some personnel do is when they go into a property and they notice a, a particular kind of equipment already there, um, the, the one that's damaged that they need to replace, for example, an extractor fan. Oh yeah, the extractor fan that's in there is uh, a Ventula, for example, um, extractor fan. And then they go there and say, okay, we'll replace it back with a similar, a like for like. Unfortunately, with changes and developments nowadays, replacing a like for like will not solve the problem, which we're, we're takes us back again to uh, the sensor triggered uh, uh, extractor fan, whereby if, even if you don't actually switch on the extractor fan, automatically on its own, once it actually picks a certain amount of condensation, it actually just triggers the, the extractor fan on its own. So again, this is where the training comes in. So I really recommend well that uh, the training really needs to be solid because we can actually make lots of savings from this. Thank you very much for that, Johnson. Pat, would you like to proceed? Um, thanks, everybody. Make a few reflections. So, Obviously, I'm very conscious that you're all very keen for progress and enthusiastic and possibly impatient, and we all get that. Mm -hmm. I think I've said before that my family have been tenants since 1964, so they've been waiting quite a long time for a good repair service. And it is the bane, has been for years the bane of Greenwich and other local authorities, I have to say. If you talk to Lewisham and Lambeth, and they'll be like, oh my God. Um, but I hope you think we've made some progress. We are only 18 months into a four-year journey. Um, so we're kind of in first, possibly slightly going into second gear just now. And you'll have heard these officers say that there are three big pieces of work that will unlock quite a lot in and of themselves. So the big one, of course, is information technology, IT. Greenwich has forever been on the back foot when it comes to technology. In 1985, I sat where Daniel Wilkinson is now sitting, 
how is the committee secretary and talking about the subject was talking about computers the new thing on the block and members said we're not going to buy any computers we need more social workers and that's what happened and honest to god since then We've been always just slightly behind everybody else, but I do think we are catching up. And that IT, when we get it fully um, operational, will unlock things like handhelds that work for the um, operatives, like self-serve um, for tenants and alerts for residents that say we're on our way, like David said. He's got the same contract as I've got with British Gas. Um, you know, where he's half an hour away or whatever, or rings up and says, actually, I'm going to be slightly later. So IT will unlock all of that. You will know, I think, that we're in the midst of negotiations on the pay and reward scheme, which has been inherited. It's about 10 years old. Um, as and when they come to fruition, they will unlock productivity, they will unlock time for supervisors to do the quality assurance checks, councillor Ege that you talked about, and will make some savings as well. And finally, the restructuring, dare not touched on, I think, the press, the go on restructuring on Friday, I think, 5th of April. And that has got quite a lot of change in it. Much of it will build capacity. Some of it will get rid of quite eccentric divisions of where teams sit and where they don't sit and who reports to who. And, you know, it's just like loads of organisations have these legacy structures where they get added on to every few years. And eventually, after about 10 or 15 years, you look at them and you think, bloody hell, that's very old. Who is that serving? So we've got to that stage and that's being worked on. So I just want to finish up two things. One is... I feel very defensive of these men and women sitting in front of you, which I have to always check, because quite rightly, you're scrutinizing. Um, but I hope you agree that they are genuinely passionate about this subject, and they will not tell you a lie. And they're very honest, and they won't overpromise. And I'm very sure that they will deliver. It just is taking a long time. And I think we've always said that, to be fair. Um, and finally, if I may, I believe this is your last panel meeting as chair. I'd like to thank you for myself. I think I've been to nearly every meeting and officers for how gracious you've been in the chair and largely positive, it, quite rightly, occasionally challenging. And also the panel itself, actually. I don't know if panels get reconstituted now. They do, okay. So if you're not coming back, thank you and goodbye. If you are coming back, see you later, bye. Thank you very much for that, Pat. Yeah, it definitely has been a pleasure. Obviously, um, this is this panel is really um, sensitive for me, especially as someone that has passed through the customer journey and knows exactly how repairs are. I do want to thank the officers, especially for taking that collaborative approach. You've always been open and transparent. I mean, sometimes me and Richard and Pat and Jamie have gotten calls and had discussions offline. Um, I've always noticed they're quite responsive as well. So I just definitely want to thank you for that and thank you for today for you know just the really detailed program that you went into and how you handled the questions that posed at you so thank you all and have a lovely evening Thank you so much. I won't keep you too long. I noted down some of the recommendations. So what I'm going to do is go via the room so that he can make a note of it. So I will start with Lade as she needs to leave. Lade, do you have any recommendations?
yeah, is for them to show us the source of um, of the data. How did they? Like I was, I expressed my concern that they used only one format. Um, the different ways. Um, I, I would refer to a recent survey that was done by another organisation where they did say they consulted with residents and how they just had a desk, a pop-up desk in the library. The staff sat down there, did not engage with anyone. And it's also sometimes a tick box exercise. So sometimes when I see those figures, um, I, I just think what's lying behind that? Because you need to get the actual. The figures are just not enough. It looks good. There's been significant changes from last year because I was here last year and I saw what the figures were. And to see the improvement, yes, that's fine. But hearing Joseph speak now about, you know, um, about um, his experience and also experience of other leaseholders where he is, it, it's very, I would like to recommend that next time when they bring figures, they, they give us a taste of where the data has been extracted from, and also that they should diversify and not just use one format. So that would be one, um, one recommendation that I would suggest. Can, can I, I just add on to that? Yeah, I was going to add on to it as well. <laughs> Um, I was going to add on the quality assurance. So with the reoccurrent jobs, I think we do need to recommend that surveyors do go out and actually see what the problem is, so what the root cause is and what the solution would be. Um, Izzy? So mine was just on the kind of feedback. So um, when I was on the Children and Young People's Scrutiny Panel, we would just get the, a big annex of data, and it was just all of the you know questions and the answers they got, and we could we don't have to it wasn't necessarily an item, but if we, we if we wanted to, we had time to go dig through it. So I don't see why we can't send us that that just the data tables. Definitely. Um, so next, I'll go on to Johnson. Your recommendation? No, uh, I think I just is an add-on as well, um, just for the record, because when this first data was presented, it was presented at a, a performance uh, meeting which I attended. I queried that data. So, in the, again, you know, I just didn't want to be too, and again, to, uh, you know, again, uh, going against them. So I, I just decided that, let, let me just decide, just um, we'll keep these in house because I did query the data because I got, I was one of those people that got a call and um, everything I said, you know, w where is it recorded? So it simply means, well, that um, it is actually open for um, alteration, yeah. you know, because um, it was taken over the phone. I don't have access to it. Yeah. So I don't know whether or not the information I've actually given I was, was actually one of the information that was presented. And I queried these because um, and nobody actually said anything about it. Yeah, thank you, um, Johnson. That's really useful information. Does anybody else have anything to add to this recommendation? Okay, thank you. I think it would also be good for them to tell us, because I'm extremely concerned that all of the um, presentation, especially around Dampold and conversation, is extremely reactive. We need to be thinking of the future. Um, and, and they're the professionals. We need to be thinking about what next. How do we reduce this? Prevention is cheaper than repairs. Um, the sensor you just mentioned, it, it, retrofitting is a massive thing, but there's some things you can do. There's some cheap, not, not cheap, there's some more cost effective measures that we can put in place. I, f I definitely agree with you, Lade. That goes on to my point. I told you about the experience of the extractor and the paint that they're using. Yeah, and it goes on to what Johnson was saying in relation to training as well. I think there's a gap there, so we do need to kind of streamline some sort of recommendation to do that. Um, David, would you like to? Yep, thank you. Um, and I'd like to see in the next report um, a lot more um, detail in terms of outcomes. So we did get out of him uh, by questioning the 90%, whether they were all successful or whether they weren't successful and whether they had to go back. We don't know. We assume most were successful. Um, but it would be useful to know how long it's been taken, how long it's taken, and, you know, what the, you know, so we know with voids, but with other repairs, we don't know how long it's taken and how, therefore, how far we're along the journey. So I would like to see more in terms of outcomes in, in the next report. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know that, Magella, you had a recommendation, because I did 
write it down? <laughs> yes. Um, basically, I think it would be useful if councillors could be could receive a briefing, a written briefing, uh, giving one-click links, uh, specifically for leaseholders, one-click links, not two, because on the front page you then have to go onto the next page to then divide between leaseholders and tenants. So that is the link we need for both tenants and leaseholders, so we can simply put that link in our email to tenants or leaseholders and say, have you tried this link? This is a direct link. Um, and any other specific links that they can give us one-click links, for example, damp, damp and mould. Because uh, the, um, uh, the, the work of having to go through a website um, questionnaire or, or trying to get to the right spot is one of the major problems for people. Um, some of us who are experienced at IT will we'll, we'll get there quicker, but even we have problems. So that these one-click links, I think, would be very useful for us, and then it would help them develop more their one-click links on on the on the web. Thank you. I know Maisie, you had a couple that I wrote down pertaining to contractors. I didn't quite get everything, but would you like to include it still? Um, yeah, it could be a suggestion or a recommendation. One was about um, when you have like written letters being sent to like sort of elderly people with uh, contractors that you also have the RBG logo on as well, so people know know what it's them, and also that maybe contractors either have some kind of ID with, with them to to outside contractors, so that people know that they're um, they've been employed by the council to do it. So that was one, and the other one was about. Um, as they're looking at the review of how re uh, residents are reporting repairs, the other way it comes in is through councillors. So maybe there could be, it feels like there needs to be a bit of guidance or something given about how we, because we all know that repairs is a huge part of our casework, so that makes that better. I don't know. That's not really a recommendation. That was, but I just, just, and that's a really good one as well. Um, Izzy, do you have anything to add? No. Um, Johnson? Yeah, I did raise the issue of um, reducing the uh, response time for uh, the web-based form. And I did flag that, you know, um, given the excuse that um, that's what other borrowers are doing, is not actually a way forward. You know, you're not actually looking at what everybody else is doing, you know, if what they're doing is not actually good enough. Yeah. You know, so you're pretty much just joining the bandwagon rather than actually um, distinguishing yourself to actually get even better. Uh, if uh, a lot of things are becoming more techy now, which simply means, well, that um, if you really want to, uh, you don't want to be left behind, we really need to be looking at the web-based form and how quickly uh, this can be responded to. Because five working days is not acceptable. And if I may just add to that, is the fact that um, I, I checked the website, so it's five working days for them to respond, and then five working days yeah. for them, so that's ten working days. So it's not really five working days. So you call, for example, and say, my ceiling is falling down, or you, on the web, my ceiling is falling down. So they would respond to you in five working days, and then when they now do that, they now have another five working days, that's ten working days. You have a baby, you have these ten working days. It isn't acceptable. I totally agree with what Johnson said. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good one. And they could even send someone out that also can't do the job. So that's another issue as well. Um, so what we're going to do with these recommendations is we will get them written up and we will circulate it to the group. If there's any discrepancies, please let us know. But once it's been agreed, obviously, we will then send it to the officers um, to make sure that they are implementing those. Um, just before I close the meeting, I would like to say the work program discussion, please could you submit your suggestions for 2024-2025. The new chair, Leo Fletcher, I will be giving him a handover, so just letting him know some of the reviews that are still outstanding. I know Retrofit is one, so we will be discussing that. I have obviously said that there will be a meeting with David and Magella so they can continue their review. And then we have the debt review as well, Izzy, that you would 
be potentially working on, but we do have to assess who would still be on this committee. I know um, David and Magella have expressed that, and I will do everything in my power to make that happen. Um, but if there is anything on the interim that you've come up with pertaining to another recommendation, please do let me know. Yes, Izzy? Well, I, I wasn't sure if we were going to be talking about this now, so I did um, write something down, um, which was mostly, I don't know how much we did this year about like, homelessness, but considering evictions um, and increased rent and uh, well, uh, resulting in homelessness seems to be such a huge thing at the moment, I do wonder if we could do more about what a resident's journey is when they approach the council as homeless, whether they're going to be evicted or they're just turning up at the town hall. Um, and I think I've had some quite um, worrying uh, feedback from some residents about how the council has responded to them when they've turned up at the council doors. So, I th I'm, you know, I'm sure that's a one-off case, I hope, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big issue, so. We did do a rough sleepers review. Um, it was a mini review, so there probably does need to be a more extensive review. So that's where you could use the opportunity to add that into the new program going forward. Yeah, I do remember that, and I thought that was really helpful. But I think that was much more about the team proactively going out to 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 homeless uh, to rough sleepers rather than people that are c approaching the council um, as homeless. And that's why it has to be more extensive. So yeah, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Does okay, David. Yeah, just um, obviously the, the, the panels are changing so that um, part of the work we do at the moment on anti-poverty, I think, goes into the economic one. Is his new <laughs> panel? <laughs> I forget the precise title, but, um, but the anti-poverty sort of part of our work goes into that. And obviously we take safer community from environment and safer communities. Which then, so we then mirror what effectively the directorate uh, responsibility in terms of housing and safer communities. So, um, we, if we want to suggest items on the anti poverty side, it will go to Izzy's new, yeah. Um, definitely, even if you do send something that doesn't fall within my panel, I will be sure to signpost it over to Izzy, who will be the new chair for that panel. So, but thank you all. It was definitely a really good meeting and very collaborative. And um, yeah, enjoy the new chair. Thank you. And thank you for all the work you've done as well. Thank you. <laughs>